Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the February DEB Stakeholder Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, again, I'm David Hubbard. I am the Business Relationship Manager for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. I'm sort of kind of new to the position, so I haven't met everyone on the phone or on the call, uh, but I will be facilitating today's meeting. Um, and as in the past um, with my predecessor, Brian Mitchell, um, Leah and I will be um, alternating uh, facilitating these meetings and I look forward to uh, continuing that tradition. Um, at this point, do we want to do self introductions, Leah? Or we yeah, we could do we I know we have a lot of new people on. I think there's a lot of new DBE firms that have joined us. So maybe if we can do some very quick introductions, that would be good. So um all right. Um I'll should I put up a list of invitees then? I think that's great. Yep, just what you see in your in your list yep. here. That'd be great. Okay, and I don't know everyone, so if I mispronounce your name, please forgive me. Um we'll start with Andrea Breen. Hi, I'm Andrea Breen. I work for Zignago ReadyMix, and I also represent in this group, NAWIC, the National Association of Women in Construction, which has a Milwaukee chapter. Great. Uh, Anna Sheck. Hi, I'm Ann Nishek. I'm the Vice President of Arrow Creek Construction, DBE contractor in the Milwaukee area, and we primarily do concrete road work and ancillary concrete work along with the roads. I'm also a member of NAWIC, and we are a member of the Native American, um, American Indian Chamber of Commerce, I should say. Thank you. Uh, Benji Hayek. Good morning, I'm Benji Hayek with um, Oneida Engineering Solutions. I'm also part of the DBE Support Services team for WSDOT. Thank you. Um, Bill Besson. Beeson. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Bill Beeson. I'm the executive director of First American Capital Corp and board member of the American Indian Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Uh, Brian Mitchell. I'm Brian Mitchell. I work for Michaels Corporation. I'm the supplier diversity manager, former DOT and former contractor. I steal your line all the time, Bill. I call myself a recovering contractor. I'm a recovering <laughs> two times over, Brian. There you go. Hey, I got two too. So <laughs> thank you, Bill. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Uh, next on my list is Brittany B with double and Lance. I can't read it, but um, yeah. And Brittany does not have a microphone. She just indicated oh, that in the okay, chat. Okay, that's right. My, my yep. apologies. Um, next, uh, Bruce Spam. Yes, hello, Bruce Spam, Span and Associates, uh, civil engineering firm. Uh, design and construction engineering inspection services and uh, been participating in the advisory committee for the since its inception and pleased to be here again today. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Leah. Thank you, David. I'm Leah Collins Horchek with WSDOT. I'm the director for the Office of Business Opportunity and Equity Compliance and the DBE program is one of the business areas that fall under um, my my bureau. So thank you and welcome everyone. We really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you, Leah. Uh, Clements. Good morning, I'm Clements for Electric and Pro, Pro 2 Pay, and I also represent American Indian Chain Chain Commerce. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Christina Crane. Hi, I'm Christina Crane, and I'm with M Squared Engineering, and I am also work with the DBE support services for WSDOT. Thank you. Tundra Davis. Hello, everyone. I'm Tundra Davis. I am the director of the Wisconsin Supplier Diversity Program, where we certify um, MBE, WB, and DBB businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mary Ferlenza. Good morning, everybody. Mary Forlenza, Federal Highway Administration, Wisconsin Division. Thank you. Um, Jessica Jitter. Hi, I'm Jesse Gitter. I'm an apprenticeship navigator with Wisconsin Apprenticeship. Sorry about that name mispronunciation. Um, Bob Gutierrez. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, Bob Gutierrez. Uh, Southeast Region Director for Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Thank you, Bob. Um, Jacob Perez. 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacob Perez. I'm the project director for the Great Lakes uh, SBTRC Small Business Transportation oh, Resource Center. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, Jeff Johnson. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Johnson. I'm a consultant engineer, uh, DBE for JW Johnson and Associates, currently contracting with WizDOT Support Services Office for their capacity building project. And I'm also a board member for the American Indian Chamber in Milwaukee, and I'm also a board member for the uh, the Potawatomi Business Development Corporation. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Jennifer Marks. Hello, everyone. Jennifer Marks, Director of Operations with Forward Service Corporation. I oversee our Southwest and Northeast Trans program. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John Anderson. John, you there? Yeah, I think he was. Looks like he's trying to do some intros, but <laughs> all right, we'll, yeah, we'll come back to you. We'll mm -hmm. come back to you, John. Um, John Swain. Yes, uh, I'm John Swan. I'm a business representative, also a uh, secretary treasurer for Labor's Local 113. I represent uh, 3,000 members in a six county area. Thank you, John. Uh, Joe Davis. Hi, I'm Joe Davis from the Construction Business Group. I'm the DBE Development Director um, for uh, the state of Wisconsin through CBG. Thank you. Uh, Deanna Krell. Hello everyone, um, I'm Deanna Krell and I am a director with Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, which is a part of Department of Workforce Development. Great, thank you. Um, Madalena Maestri. Hi everyone, I am Madalena and I am the DBE Program uh, Chief and happy to see you all here, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Matt Grove. Hi everyone, Matt Grove, Wisconsin Transportation Builders Association, representing the highway contracting industry. Thank you, Bill Moore. Good morning, Bill Moore, WizDOT Southeast Freeways Design Supervisor. Thank you, Jay Obenberger. Good morning, I'm uh, here at Madeline and Bob Gutierrez's request to, to give an update on some Southeast construction projects. Great, thank you. Uh, Bumi Aleppo. Uh, sorry about that. I was talking to myself. Um, <laughs> Bumi Aleppo for the development session chief for the Southeast region on three hour projects. Thank you. Um, Patep Singh. Hello. I think we're having a little trouble here. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. I go ahead. Apologies, everyone. John Anderson, uh, Southeast Director of the WRTB Southeast uh, Trans Provider. Okay. Thank you, um, Rosalind Roberts. Hi, I'm Rosalind Robertson. I am the WISDA DB Support Services Coordinator and the Annual Event Coordinator. Welcome. Thank you. Jason Rozell. Hey, good morning, everybody. Jason Rozell, WISDA Southeast Freeways Construction Supervisor, um, overseeing the reconstruction of the Zoo Interchange North Lake Project. So I'll be providing a little bit of information about that project here. Thank you. Ruben Anthony. Good morning. I'm Ruben Anthony, I'm a consultant with WISDOT uh, through my company, Rojack. I'm also the uh, former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Transportation and currently the President of the Urban League of Greater Madison. Thank you. Um, Reem Shaheen. Uh, good morning. I'm Reem Shaheen. I am a Project Development Supervisor for the 3R projects uh, for WISDOT. Thank you, Reem. Um, Shannon. Ross. Can 
You're on mute, Shannon. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. It's child care duties. Um, Shannon Ross with these trucks, um, a kind of a new transportation company um, with DBE and MBE certification. So just trying to see about um, any opportunities. Thank you. Great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Shiva, Chef, uh, I'm going to butcher your name. Sorry. Come on. It's not <laughs> that bad. Hi, I'm Shiva Satasivam. I'm the president of Clinko Technologies. We are a small IT company and a construction management company. And I used to work for DOT as the consultant services director. Thank you. Signe uh, Reichelt. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. This is the first time I've been on this call. My name is Signe Reichel. I'm with Banking Materials Engineering. We're a DBE firm. Um, we supply technicians and do materials testing on the agency side of the QCQA package. We do QA. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Michael Stoud. Hi, I'm Michael Stoudy. I'm the OBA Compliance Chief with WISDOT. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Mercado. Hi, everyone. I'm part of Brian Mitchell's team at Michael's Construction and the Supplier Diversity Specialist. Thank you. Um, Tracy Griffith. Thank you, David. Tracy Griffith, Director of Outreach and Partnerships for the Wallback Group family of companies. Great. Thank you. Uh, Trevor Walner. Good morning. I'm Trevor Walner, also representing the Wallbeck Group. Um, Wallbeck companies primarily in the DOT sector would be Zenith Tech, Payne and Dolan, and Northeast Asphalt, commonly serving as prime contractors. Great. Thank you. Ugo? Uh, good morning, Ugo Abarocha, President of the National Association of Minority Contractors, Wisconsin, also Chairman of the Business Council, Metropolitan Walk Association of Commerce, and President of Diamond District International. Great, thank you. Um, Chua Zeng. Zeng. Hi, good morning. I'm Chua Zhang. Please call me CC. I'm a Compliance Program Specialist with WISDAT. Thank you. Thank you, CC. And Yakasta. Zimparipa, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I'm Alderwoman Jocasta Zamaripa. I represent the 8th Aldermanic District on Milwaukee's near south side, arguably the most diverse district in the city, if not the state, and home to a supermajority Latino community. So happy to be here with you. Thank you. And thank I'll, you for I'll, joining I'll, us, and sorry for mispronouncing your name. <laughs> I'll teach David how to roll those R's. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on with that. Uh, thank you. Is anybody I missed that was on the phone or somebody who joined us that touched late that I missed uh, for a self introduction? Yes. Oh. Go ahead, please introduce yourselves. This is Karen Krieger. I'm owner of MJ Krieger Trucking, and we do a lot of work with um, DOT projects. Thank you. I think it was Joshua, John, Joshua Johnson is going through the airport. He put into chat um, that he is with us. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Great. So um, moving forward here, um, as a representative from the secretary's office, I'd like to convey that I'm um, Secretary Thompson and oh, one Deputy Secretary. Announcement. Oh, I'm sorry. Pratap Singh from K. Singh and Associates. We are a civil, environmental and transportation. OK, sorry about that. Thank you. We had a little trouble hearing you earlier, so thank you for for your introduction. Um, so uh, Secretary uh, Thompson and Deputy Secretary Paul Hammer want me to um, welcome you this morning uh, to this morning's meeting, and especially uh, those who have not joined us recently or not have been active on the committee at all or are new to the committee. So they certainly welcome your participation. They also want me to underscore um, the department's commitment to work with DBE firms as we continue to improve um, Wisconsin's transportation infrastructure. Um, both Paul and Craig um, are looking forward to participating in next week's um, DEB workshop and networking summit. And as you probably know, Secretary Thompson will be presenting the Golden Shovel Awards um, next Friday at, at lunch. So both of them are looking forward to that, that event. Um, 
So after I walk through today's agenda, I might ask Leah to just provide some overview about the upcoming summit next week. And um, uh, so if you if you want to do that at the appropriate uh, point, Leah, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, yesterday. Do, so go ahead. David, why don't I go ahead and jump in since you mentioned that, if that's OK? Yeah, go ahead, please. Great. So David just met, mentioned that um, we have our annual DBE workshop and networking summit. Um, it's scheduled for next week on March 3rd and um, March 4th. And just for those of you, I know that we have a lot of new people that are, you've been, uh, we've had members on our DBE stakeholder advisory group for over a year now. And so many of you are new to um, WSDOT and the work that we do in the DBE program. I just wanted to give you a little background about the annual event. So we've had this annual event for more than 30 years that WSDOT has hosted the annual event and networking workshop. And it really is our goal to bring people together to promote developing talent in the highway construction industry. Um, we work collaboratively every single year. We put a planning team together um, that includes diverse DBE firms. Um, the National Association of Minority Contractors, NAMAC, um, also um, is on our planning committee. And this team um, works to identify workshop sessions that are the most interest and, and will benefit workshop attendees. Our theme this year is, is Build Back Strong. Um, last year, our event was all virtual. This year, we're uh, proud to offer a hybrid experience. So as I mentioned, day one of the event is on, May, on March 3rd, and um, that will be workshops, and the workshops will be all virtual. Um, day two of the event is on March 4th, and that is a great opportunity. That's where we have our networking sessions, which will be in person, and that will be at the Ingleside Hotel in Pewaukee. So if you're not registered for the event, I highly encourage that you consider joining us. Um, if you cannot come to the full conference, you can register to attend the virtual workshops only. And for again, for those of you that are new to the work that we do at WISTA, attending this event will provide you with a wealth of information about the DBE program and the variety of services that we offer. I'm just gonna share a sampling of some of the workshops that um, we're offering this year. Um, at our general session, um, you will have the opportunity to receive updates from the Federal Highway um, Administration, um, specifically the Wisconsin Division Administrator, Glenn Falkerson. So I'm sure he'll be talking about the bipartisan infrastructure law and the funding and how that will impact Wisconsin. Um, he'll also talk about the DBE program as well. So I think everyone will benefit from hearing um, from hearing his uh, updates and the perspectives that he will share with all of us. You will also have an opportunity to meet um, the Division Transportation System Development Administration. So you'll be able to meet Rebecca Burkle, who is our administrator, um, Scott Lowry, who is the Deputy Division Administrator for the um, bureaus, and Scott Becker, who is the Deputy Administrator for the regions. They will also share updates and talk about the DBE program. We will provide DBE program update, so we'll have a session for that. Um, we'll have other sessions on how to access business loans, credits for DBE contractors, qualifications and processes, navigating with stats, highway construction, um, contracting information website. Uh, we're gonna have a great panel discussion on workforce labor challenges and solutions um, and a whole host of other ones. So yeah, I'm talking about this and I'm spending a lot of time talking about this because I really want to stress that this is a great opportunity. So if you're not registered, please attend. Um, the secretary will also give out golden shovel awards um, to recognize individual firms and contractors for their positive contributions. Also on day two, NAMAC will be hosting an innovation and technical uh, session, um, which is always very popular. Um, and we will also have a variety of networking sessions with prime contractors, with trans graduates, with consultants, and also the opportunity to network with WSDOT project leaders. So again, please consider attending if you're not registered. Thank you, David. Thank you, Leah. That was a great overview. I appreciate that. Um, so yesterday you should have received an email from uh, Christina that included a number of attachments, um, including today's meeting agenda, committee meetings, 
um, meeting minutes from the January 27th meeting, including uh, meeting minutes from both breakout sessions. Um, some slides that will be presented by Bob Gutierrez and his team on Southeast Opportunities and the flyer for the upcoming workshop next week. Um, if you haven't already done so, please take a look at the minutes and let us know if you have any changes or edits, corrections. Um, if you have those now, you can tell us those. Otherwise, please just email them to Madalena or Leah. That'd be great. Um, so looking at the agenda for today, um, we'll be starting next with um, Bob Gutierrez and his team um, presenting um, some upcoming project opportunities in the Southeast region. And we're going to encourage folks to ask questions about those. Um, next, uh, Madalena will provide um, an overview of the DB utilizations. Um, next, uh, Leah will be talking about the labor utilization in the Southeast region. And then finally, we'll break into our um, subcommittee groups, um, the business committee and the labor committee. Um, and that'll last about just a touch over an hour, starting at 1045, assuming we're on schedule. Um, and then we'll regroup um, at the end, and we're going to have about a 10-minute discussion, a full discussion, uh, kind of talking about what we discussed uh, briefly in those breakout sessions, and then kind of a wrap-up. So any questions? Okay, hearing none. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Gutierrez. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We've got, uh, you got Reams. Reams, if you could turn on your camera. Um, so, so last meeting we did a, a nice comprehensive view of, of projects um, in, in the past, um, some of the uh, some of the goals that that were met, and then we showed um, se several projects um, for the future. Um, so, but we didn't have a lot of time for interaction and questions and and such. So we 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 thought uh, maybe we recap and revisit and I'll let Reem and and Jason and Jay uh, really uh, lead the conversation here. Um, but um, I, again, we'd love for this to be interactive. We'd love to get your juices going on questions and everything else. So um, Reem, thank you. Yes. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, so like Bob was saying last time I presented uh, some you know, some Southeast opportunities. And I talked about some co accomplishments that we did in the past and some future projects that uh, have future possibilities. But I felt like we poured everything on you and it was too much information and didn't give an opportunity for everyone to to have an open discussion or, or collect some comments. So um, if everyone can see my screen, this was what we was pre was presented, and I'm going to basically just pull up the slides of the major ones we have underway and use them as an opening to have an open discussion. And we do have all the supervisors and chiefs here that are overseeing those specific projects. So if anybody has any comments or questions or discussion that, about the DBE status, involvement, communication, um, or any other concerns that you might have, you know, um, please speak up or take this opportunity to do so. So anybody? So why don't we have uh, Jason maybe go through just this information and then um, just talk a little bit about uh, the DBE interactions on uh, Zoo North Lake and, and just some of the things that are coming up. But, uh, oh, I see Madeline has got her hand up. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks so much um, also to you all for, for doing this recap. I wanted to note that uh, I think this is a partial list of the DBs that are involved on this particular project. Um, we had about 30 DBs total that came in and keep getting added. So this might be a fixed in time piece, I'm not sure, but just wanted to let you know that on the construction side, this continues to grow with many DBEs committed on the project. So just that little addition. Thanks. Yeah, so I can just talk briefly about the Zoo North Lake. So yeah, it's a $160 million construction contract that was let in October of 2020. So we're we're entering basically year two of a three year project. And uh, the critical path on the project is really the Union Pacific Railroad portion of the project. So they've been working heavily on getting 
getting the the new railroad structure built over the freeway while trains are on the temporary shoe fly structure that was built uh, last year. So yeah, we have a number of DBE consulting firms that are working um, on the construction oversight contract with us. I think there's 1.4, uh, $1 1.5 million dollars there of DBE uh, dollars going to um, construction consultants. And then as Madalena mentioned on the on the, the contract contractor side of things, we have uh, currently 27 DBE um, either sub sub consult, excuse me, subcontractors, material suppliers, or trucking companies um, working on the Zoo North Lake project. So the commitment there is at 13.8% or um, and rising. So our goal was 15, we're at 13.8, and we're we're continuing to add DBE. Um, on the project so total paid to date on the project is uh, a little over 50 million dollars and um, about 12 percent of that 6.6 .6 million has gone to dbe um, contractors on the project uh, project's been going really well we've uh we've been meeting all the milestones and deadlines and uh looking forward to a busy 2020 there's a lot lot going on here in in the next the next year on the project with uh, switching traffic over to the southbound side and rebuilding the northbound side of the freeway and continue to work on a number of the structures um, going over Mayfair Road and continuing to work on that Union Pacific Railroad Bridge and also rebuilding North Avenue uh, underneath the freeway as well. Uh, upcoming work on the Zoo North Lake project, we do have a, a landscaping project that's going to be let this year and that that letting is in August, so there's some good opportunity there for some some landscaping work that you know is a potential DBE opportunity. Um, but that's about it on the North Leg. If, if there's any questions, let me know. So, what's the time horizon for the project? I, I'm sorry. What was the question? What's the time horizon for the project? It sounds like it'll be active real soon and then when is it expected to be completed yeah so the uh the actual main north lake contract has been going since fall of 2020 and it the completion date is in um, november of 2023 so we have this year 2022 rebuilding the north side of the freeway and, uh, and then 2023 rebuilding the south side of the freeway basically uh, the landscaping contract gets let in August and we'll start this fall and um, finish then in 2023, but then there will be um, care cycles uh, that extend for a few years beyond that time frame, um, you know, with the, the trees and plants and things that are going to be put in with that contract. So we're still finalizing those plans and working through the details of it, but um, that's about a six hundred thousand dollar or so construction contract. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, Jason. Um, you know we we're pretty transparent here. Um, and um, so what do well, one of the discussions you had with the prime contractor was, I I, I believe um, whether a a DB firm services or supply was part of the, you know, uh, of the DB commitment. Um, do, it, do you see that as a, a, a do you see as a challenge either on this project or other projects that you've been involved with when you're you're dealing with the the prime and 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 trying to figure out those percentages. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Michaels is the prime contractor on the Zoo North League. They've been they've been doing a really good job. I think, uh, you know, working with DBE contractors, suppliers, trucking companies, and like I said, they've they've con they've been continuing to add more more contractors to this project and and find additional opportunities in various areas. There's, you know, a lot of different aspects to this project. We have some polymer overlay work and things like that that. Um, the majority of that work is is a DBE contractor, and there's been some additional drilling activities and things that have needed some some additional help that have that have been DBE um, dollars. And so it, 
it, it's the, the challenges are always there to, to, to find um, the right opportunities for the right um, companies. But I think that, you know, we've been able to be successful on this, this, you know, large project to, to, to get close to that goal. And, and I think, you know, continue to work towards getting to that 15%. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. And it, and it lo really looks like, you know, the opportunity, especially on this job, um, start at the beginning of a project and go all the way through to, to finishing up, uh, you know, towards the end. Um, sometimes typically we'll, we'll, we may see DBEs come in at, uh, you know, kind of towards the, the end of the project and, and finish up things. But um, it looks like this project, they, opportunities were across the board. Great. Um, if nobody has any questions or further questions, we can go to the another project. OK, OK, so um, thank you, thank Jason. You. <laughs> so, so the other one is uh, I-43, another major contract we have, and Jay Obenberger is here to talk. He is also uh, overseeing this project. So Jay, do you want to give a few words and open it up for discussion on this one? Uh, yeah, I'll be uh, very brief. Um, this project uh, was let in November of 21, so we just had the pre-con. Um, we just had our trans meeting as part of our pre-con. Um, so actually this week we just started doing the prep work with a little bit of shoulder closures. Um, and this weekend we'll have our first major work with demoing some of the bridges over the interstate. Um, so uh, it was let in November, 107 million. Um, you know, all the consultants, we moved into our field office. They're all on board. Uh, we got $1.6 million there. Um, our DB goal was 10%. Michael's, our prime, came in a little higher at 10.75%. Um, and so far, we're, you know, we're kind of seeing uniform across the board with um, suppliers and trucking and as well as contractors out in the field. So um, not a whole lot to say. Um, David Wen will be talking in more detail about the I-43 program at the summit next week. So um, I guess if you have any questions. I do have another 43 slide if you want to talk about this one too. Yeah, the previous project I covered was, I call it the northern segment, it's Ozaki County. This is the county line interchange, so this was let in December of 21 for 49 million. Um, same thing, consultant contracts, about 1.5 million, same thing, we just moved into our field office. Um, we we're just held our pre-con. Um, Hoffman is the prime contractor. Uh, they came right in at the 10% the goal. Um, and so we are, <clears throat> so far, everything has been, we're, we're a little further behind on the information on the county line versus the Ozaki County line job, um, but it seems like the work is spread out and um, so far so good. So, so Jay, Jay, where's most of the DBE work happening on these two projects? Um, Reem, if you want to go to the previous one. All right, so this is the Ozaki County one. So if you will look down at some of the DB contractors, um, the biggest ones are Arrowcrete and um, uh, what was the other? Um, um, Adaptive Electric, so they're doing a lot of the electrical and then a lot of it's in trucking and then a lot of it's in the supplies. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. And Jay, the next, oh, yeah, yeah, Jay, have you heard any um, concerns from from prime contractors on DB capacity and and uh, ability to uh, perform the the work? And uh, and. Either of the I-43 jobs at this time, we haven't heard anything. Um, as part of our pre-con, we did have our trans graduate uh, 
portion. Um, and there was actually a company there that was interested and introduced itself and in, in their oh, uh, capabilities. Um, but at the okay. county line one, there was uh, nobody. So um, I, we've been working closely with Madalena and her group as to kind of the next steps with that, so. Great. Oh, we got a question for Bruce. 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 Yeah, not a question, but just want to also comment that, uh, of course, we uh, professional services is part of the project as well, meaningful way and on the uh, construction engineering inspection. Just want to make sure everyone notices that as well. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't know how much time we have, but we could put one more slide. Uh, but um, I don't know what the agenda is. Uh, go ahead. And go, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. OK, good. Yeah, go. That's fine. So, so we have Highway 50 and Jay is also overseeing those. So um, Jay, do you want to touch base on that one? Yeah, so uh, this was let in December 2020. This is a two and a half year job. It's uh, about just under 100 million, 97 million dollars. Um, Again, professional services consultant, uh, 1.4 million. Um, we are about 50% done. Um, the, the limits say I-94 to 74th. This job is kind of split into two halves. That's actually the west half. The east half is 74th to about 48th Street. Um, and we haven't done any work on 74th to 48th. Um, so on the west half, we are this winter we've been finishing the last three bridges um, and this spring we will finish the signal work on that west half and then on the east half we got to start everything from removing pavement to temporary signals to um, so we had a dbe goal of about 15 percent on this zignago the prime contractor um, submitted a db commitment of 20.9 uh, we've had some change orders that are uh, up, went up about two tenths of a percent to 21.1 and we are about 50 percent through which is about where we are with the construction at this time um, so everything's tracking well um, this spring we will hit critical path with some of the dbs um, uh, when we start that east half of the project there will be a lot of underground work done by dk contractors as well as the the temporary signals and finishing the signals on the west half with pro electric um, so there will be a jump up here this spring um, we should have probably like the zoo did we probably should have broken this out by tier one tier two and tier three contractors um, because we have been working very closely with the compliance unit because all we have is the the payroll to track progress um, but everything's been going very smoothly with signago and they've been doing an excellent job so uh, uh, there's a hand up davis joseph davis hey jerry uh quick question uh, what i'm taking a look at is the utilization of dbe's um, on all three projects. And the question that I have is that, um, you know, eventually what's going to happen is hopefully it doesn't happen, but it, it looks this way is that utilization and capacity because, you know, the upcoming lettings that are coming out and currently working on these projects. Um, are you concerned about the capacity uh, as we move forward? Um, in ongoing utilization and if they're going to be able to reach their target um, in order for them to provide the services and, and meet the DBE goals. Um, I, I've been assigned mostly to the freeway jobs, um, so a lot of our uh, DBE contractors are, are Aerocrete, um, DK, Community Traffic Control Company, Pro Electric, and, and they seem to be rather large companies that have multiple crews. I'm sure some of those are even assigned to the zoo interchange as well. So um, they always seem to do a very good job of scheduling their crews and spreading out the work. They seem to work very good with the primes. Um, I, it's hard for me to say, are we getting reach into a tipping point? I, I haven't seen it. Um, maybe the contractor can talk more about that. And I, I appreciate that because I'm not so much concerned about, you know, the professional service side of it, but actually the construction side. I mean, because 
I mean, all of us are going to uh, be at the workshop about how much more money is coming in with more projects on the line. I just want to make sure that, you know, if, if folks are scaling up DBEs, uh, we want to make sure that they have the capacity to perform the work and they don't make it. They don't, they don't, there's not an impact on their utilization or uh, their capacity. It's a great question, Joel, and and thanks for bringing that up. And and yeah, smart scheduling and and understanding the schedules of of the of the project, the critical paths that we talked about, um, is 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 vitally important. I, I see we got another question. Great. Mm -hmm. Anne. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, this Anne. Is Anne. Anne with Arrow Creek calling. I'm calling from the phone with the microphone. Most of these projects are multi-year projects. So I know we've got a lot of work, but I also know only a half or less is going to be done this year and the rest is next year. So I got to keep that in mind. They're not all to be done in one year. Yeah. Yep. True. Looks like we have another question. This is Roslyn. I just want to uh, just kind of address uh, what Joe Davis, his interest in utilization. This is the excellent time for a DBE if they want to grow to take advantage of our loan, our mobilization loan program, because that's what it's all about. If someone wants to grow and they can't because they stuck on this project, this is the time to get in, get that, get that guarantee so that you can get that additional mo money to to grow your business and take advantage of other opportunities. Great. Uh, yep. Yeah, I was curious how many of these projects do they involve uh, box trucks? Because that's what we primarily have. We don't have dump trucks, so I'm just curious if um, box trucks, straight trucks are um, involved in these. Yeah. There is a lot of box trucks with the delivery of supplies and material and stuff. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't know to what extent maybe somebody from the DB office does. Madalena, do you have any information on that? I do not have uh, information specific on box trucks. Our engineer is not here, but each um, time we go through a project, as we set the DBE goal, we do look at every opportunity and where trucking may be um, part of that. And I know box trucking can come in oftentimes more incidentally, but Karen Krieger has her hand up and she's with M&J Trucking, so she might be able to address this a little more. Karen, do you have some insight there? No, Madalena, not necessarily to the box truck. I just have a question on... Um, pertaining to these projects so okay sorry so go ahead and shannon if you want to follow up with me too we can go through some um, individual projects to look at where those opportunities are madalena before we leave shannon's question um shannon i mean you should look at um, how um leasing trucks play in and those might be uh, trucks to allow you to have the open trucks and carry um you know uh, um different uh, aggregates uh, to and from the jobs. But when we talk about capacity building, that's one of those things that if you don't have the right trucks, then you should be looking at capacity building. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Hi, so I'm looking at these slides and I see my name projected on a few of them. And we have worked on some of these projects, but I have a question as to the bidding process. We had a situation where we we were asked to fill a Schedule A, sign it for a specific dollar amount. I did not get this DBE or the Schedule A commitment back signed from the contractor. Um, and I did approach the contractor asking, you know, in order for us to realize our work and be able to not overcommit to projects will you let me know did you utilize your schedule a and they said no we have other commitments so basically there was no commitment made but i'm seeing my name on that project in a previous slide how do we prevent so, that from happening well i think the issue here is that the the prime isn't communicating with you when they've included you on a commitment. So ideally what's happening is 
um, you are selected, they put you on the commitment, parent low bidder, um, we see the rankings, we've got an award, we've got an execution of contract. And at that point, um, they're confirming with you um, whatever your hiring agreement is, um, start talking about schedule, those types of things. We do hear a lot from DBEs that they are not aware when they've been put on a commitment. And so we definitely recommend that you are reaching out to confirm that with the Prime, but we're also um, trying to get Primes to take that step as well. Um, and at least to say, um, you know, just if you see us as the apparent low bidder, um, we're gonna utilize you on the project. So that way, at least you've got an upfront. Uh, we're gonna keep working on it. You know, the best we can do there is just to keep communicating and keep asking for that. Keep asking DBEs, follow up with the Prime and um, asking the Prime and or other tiers to let you know if they've used you on the commitment. Um, you can only be listed here if the Prime put you on the official commitment. So you're on the 1506 and we've got a signed attachment A. So that means they are intending to use you. So if you saw your name here and you're not, then you should follow up with that Prime and say, hey, great, I know I'm on your job, you know, let's do a hiring agreement. Yeah. In return to that, so my, I know how the, pro, how the process works. My question is, I did reach out to the Prime and I said, oh, you know, I, I see you're an apparent low bidder. Are you planning to utilize us on this project? And they said, I said, could I please have that signed commitment A back? Um, with your signature on it and they they specifically said they will not be committing a certain dollar amount to us so how do we know how much trucking we're gonna have to supply to them again so that we don't overcommit on other projects well so, so follow up with me separately but they have they have put a number on their commitment so they have decided they'll use you for at least a minimum of X amount, $25,000, whatever it may be, that is on your signed attachment A and on our commitment. So we okay. expect them to meet that commitment. And if they cannot, then they need to follow, you know, the commitment modification policy. They need to have notification to you, the project team, to us. I mean, it's a complicated process to get out of a commitment. They cannot simply just say, oh, we're not sure if we're going to use you or you know, we put you on there by accident. That does not work. And we have, in particular, I know we're short on time, but since we're focusing on Southeast region, we've established a very good relationship with our project teams. Jason yeah. has been part of this discussion as well, in terms of, you know, that that project team is gonna let the DB office know if they're seeing a variation in the commitment. Um, if it looks like something's not on track, all of us are in, um, conversation about that. So if you are finding an anomaly in your own um, commitments, please do let us know because we have a good process in place uh, to track this. Great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Bob. I just wanted to ask, um, probably Madalena, who was just speaking, how big of a problem is this? Because this is worrisome to me that the prime contractor is flouting right that well, I have these this DBE, but but she just said that she was her her business was listed, but they're not getting the uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're, she's not benefiting from it. So I'm just wondering how common does that you know how common is that and is it a problem that needs to be addressed? It just makes makes me a little worried to hear this. Sure. Yeah, this is the first time, and I'm sure it has happened before. This is the first time I'm hearing that. Um, the DB is listed on the commitment and is not ever used. Um, again, it must happen, but this is the first time it's coming to me. The um, the thing we do hear commonly, though, is the DBE doesn't know that they're on the commitment, and it can get a couple months down the road, and then the prime reaches out and says, okay, so we're going to need you on the job at whatever point, and they're like, wait a minute, I didn't even know I was on this job, and it's particularly difficult for truckers when that happens because they've committed to other jobs, so now they can't fulfill their original commitment even though you know they didn't know so that upfront communication is troublesome um being put on the commitment and not following through we don't see that um because we're continually tracking it so 
Um, and again, I, sorry to take too much time, but a piece of our monitoring for commu commercially useful function, it's called cuff. We have to monitor those commitments and make sure that a DBE is getting paid. So that's where our compliance team will also help us. They're looking at a monthly commitment. So if we see Emma J. Krieger on, on that commitment, for instance, we're getting a certain way down the road and there are no payments to them, we're going to reach out to the prime and say, um, okay, so when are you utilizing this DBE? So there are multiple ways that we, we tap into that to make sure that a DBE isn't just getting listed and then never used. Thanks. So we'll take one more question from Joe. Yeah, I, I just real short. I want to thank Karen for actually bringing that up because it goes directly to my question I, I, I asked Jay, and that is utilization and capacity. Uh, because if DBEs overcommit themselves, then you know it's a bad mark on the DBE or not non-performing. So I, I think this is a great discussion, and thanks Karen for bringing the uh, bringing that to light. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, and and I, we did see Ugo's um, comment in the in the comment section. So thank you, Ugo. Um, I, I I believe the uh, 43 projects actually in you, literally in your backyard. So <laughs> you'll be able to kind of monitor us on on quite a bit of that. So um, so everybody, I, I appreciate your time and um, continue asking the great questions. Thank you, Reem. Um, and and Jay and Jason um, and uh, David, we can we can uh, move on to the yeah. Great, thank you, Bob. That was a, that was a good discussion, um, and your team appreciate it very much. Uh, we'll next go to Madalena to talk about DEB utilization. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm going to share quickly my screen and um, and bring you into our overall utilization. Thanks again, Southeast team. And I'm really good we spent the time on that, that discussion. So thanks everybody for contributing. Ordinarily, I'm sharing with you the breakdown on those projects, 5043 and Zoo, and where we're at with uh, the DB commitment and uh, breaking that out into demographics as well. However, we're in a season where there's not a lot of movement since we don't have um, crews out there. So I'm going to show you our overall um, commitments at this time. It's always moving as we move, as you know, we go through the months. I'll zoom in a little. Um, it's, it is not the most user friendly report, but I'll call out a few things to you here. First of all, our overall annual goal is 12.41%. So that is what we're aiming for on all of our projects, construction and commitment at construction and consulting and any commitments that come in after the contract is executed. So when we're looking right here, we're looking at our um, our full contract award. So this is how much um, the full contract value is at um, bid time and then the amount of the federal funding. Our overall projected construction federal funds for FFY 2022 is 834 million. So you can see we're around halfway into that full amount. Um, 141 contracts have been awarded. Now these numbers can change when a project um, is not actually awarded and these are our bid letting numbers or it's relet at a different time. So our end of year report will look different than this, but this is kind of a real time where are we at um, having gotten through the February letting. Um, we're still working on some December awards because we had some GFE that's good faith effort where the bidder did not meet the goal. They have put in um, a request for us to consider their efforts. And a couple of those um, are still in process. So overall, when you're looking at where are we at with our commitments on the construction side, we're about 10.18% overall. And that breaks down into conscious. So this is where they met the goal. Um, this is a signed goal. They've met it at least this much of it, 45 million, and then this much, 1.6 million in construction was over the assigned goal at the time of bid. Um, and then we have some of our modifications in right now. This is what happens after contract execution. This is gonna be pretty uh, short right now because we're not in, um, in our actual construction season. So um, you can see though, we've got about 2.5 million uh, in modifications. And this also takes into account if there was a reduction in a commitment. 
So that's our overall um, additions and subtraction. So once we add in our consulting commitments at about 9.1 million, this is through January, um, and that funding, which is the federal portion at 34 million, we come up with um, 57 million in total DBE commitments at this point, which is representing almost 12%. So you'll recall that we had about, uh, we have a 12.41 overall goal. So we want to hit this 12.41. Once we can see that we are trying towards meeting that goal, uh, we will start backing off of our upfront goals as well. Also to note, we've started adding some uh, goals onto the consulting projects and um, design build projects will also have DBE goals. So there are many more opportunities coming up. And maybe if you're not talking, you could just mute because there's some noisiness in the background. For Christina, you can mute people. Um, thank you. Uh, so that's that's what I wanted to share with you on utilization and where we're at right now. So um, any questions for me? I can't see hands up on. I don't see any at the moment, uh, Madeline. Okay. Madalena, can you go back and explain the 2.5 million uh, towards the right? I can't see the column yeah. heading. Sure. Yep. Those are our modifications. So this is after contract execution. So if there's a reduction in the DB commitment or if there is additional DB participation, we're recording it in that modification column. So the initial piece of this report is still showing you what we brought in at let. And then we've got these modifications that happen after contract execution. Okay, so is that an additional 2.5 million towards the DBE goal? Yes, but okay. that is captured in our overall percentage here. Okay. Last year, you may remember we were right around 20 million in additional commitments after contract execution. The previous year, we were we had only captured 2 million. Uh, that was the first year we started really concentrating efforts. So we do hope to move again towards towards that upper end. Well, I don't know if it's going to be 20 million or not, but it will certainly be, um, we could safely say it should be pretty significant. Thank you. Great conversation. Sure. Thank you. Great. Um, um, Madalena, you got yeah. a question from Ugo. Yep. Oh, okay. Yes, Ugo. Good morning, Madalena. Um, yes, good morning. I'm doing three things I may have overlooked, so my apologies if I overlooked. Is, is, on the DB achievement, is there any demographic breakdown also, or is that too early to have those numbers? It is too early, but we'll wrap up the first half of the federal fiscal year at the end of March, and so then we'll start analyzing that. And so probably, um, I'm not sure April, but by May, we should be able to be sharing um, some demographic information with this uh, group. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here is just another plug for our um, our workshop. So please check out that flyer that was attached. Um, register from here, page two uh, of the attachment, I do believe has um, actual specific workshops. So that's all for me, thank you. Great, thank you, Madalena. Um, next, we have labor utilization in Southeast region. Leah? Yep, and I will quickly go over. I will also make sure that um, the detailed report is included uh, in the meeting minutes. So hang on just a minute while I work to share my screen with everyone. All right, can everyone see the rep yes. my, my Okay, great. All right, just quickly here, I just want to high, uh, do a high level overview of labor utilization um, in the Southeast region, looking at the zoo interchange um, project as far as um, in this report um, is through uh, January 31st, it should be 2022. So that's incorrect, I'll make the corrections on there. Um, and the total number of employees is 732. So out of that utilization, 28% 28, 28 was minority uh, labor and 1% female participation on that project. 
For Highway 50 in Kenosha, there were a total of 731, 35 employees. Again, this goes through the um, end of January of this year, so I'll make the correction on that year. Um, and the number of minorities, the percentage of participation, 41%, and for female participation, 2%. And then for Highway 10 um, on Washington Avenue in the city of Racine, uh, 363 employees, minority participation at 46% and 3% female participation. Again, this does break down by um, race um, and ethnic demographics, and we will include that in the meeting minutes for you to review it closely. And we can talk more about this at our labor advisory breakout. If there, um, I don't know if there's any questions. Um, I don't see I, any questions right now. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're at the point in the agenda. We're going to break, um, go into our breakout sessions. Um, through the magic of the internet, we'll be divided into um, our two groups, business committee and labor committee. Um, and then we'll regroup at 1150. So we'll have to make up a little time. Um, I want to stay on schedule and conclude by noon. So, um, Basically, we have 55 minutes or so in those breakout sessions, and then um, we'll be put back into the full group uh, for a 10 minute follow up discussion and closing. So thank you. Consultants on our projects. And so uh, I'm going to ask a, a few questions to prompt a, a conversation, and I want to make sure that uh, in this conversation again, uh, that we are able to capture a perspective from contractors and also capture a perspective from consultants. So uh, if we, if, as I ask the questions, I'll make sure that we do that. So what are the things that um, you would like to see that would help your company be more successful in pursuing work with WizDot? And this question, when you answer it, say I'm a consultant or I'm a contractor. And, and others that are involved uh, can also add, but I definitely want to capture um, a perspective from contractors and consultants. The floor is open, so go, jump right in there and I'll repeat the question. What are some things that you would like to see that would help your company be more successful in pursuing work with WISDOT? Anybody? Ruben, this is Jeff Johnson, JW um, consultant question. What's up, Jeff? Uh, I, um, it's been a while. It's good to see you. Say uh, to 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 your to your question. Uh, one of the I'm doing. Uh, I'm engaged with the DV capacity project with Madalena and her office. Um, one of the questions that comes up a lot from the consultant side: Where are the resources dedicated to us? I see a lot of resources out for the contractors, and I have to in interpret, or I've got to read between the lines. So maybe, and I don't, I know it's difficult to get those resources into one clearinghouse or one, in one spot. The department does do a very good job of disseminating that information. I think that there should be more time and energy given to uh, separating it out, meaning, hey, this is directed at specifically for consultants and for, uh, or, or for the con contractors. I mean, I mean, it's just a just a fundamental explanation. I, I only because I'm being asked a lot that question. That's all. You know. So, thank you. So, Jeff, your your um um your response um highlights the fact that you know uh, DBE contractors and DBE consultants may have different needs, right? And so the resources that the department has should be spelled out. Um, you know, as much as it can be about what type of support you might have for each entity. That's correct, sir. All right. Others want to respond to that question. What are things that you'd like to see uh, that would help your company be more successful in pursuing work with WISDOT? Yeah, this is uh, Pratap Singh from K Singh. We would like to see if you can get design services. I mean, among the consulting community. I am not also maintained for for uh, design of infrastructures for the DOT and how the DB firms, consulting firms are getting benefited with that. Okay, so I had a hard time hearing you because you kept cutting off, Dr. Singh. Can you just 
Give me a little more clarification about that. I would like uh, to see what we can do. Can you hear me? I can hear you better now. We would like to see what we can do to participate more in design. Uh, in design of our projects. We are seeing very limited opportunities. And I would like to see what can we do to improve on that one and we have is. We have been doing a lot of design, but in the last two or three years. Majority of the contracts have been through. And uh, there is hardly any. Any participation for uh, firms like us in design. OK, so there's some seems, feedback. Yeah. So there seems to be a lack of design opportunities for DBE firms. Is that what you're saying? Is for. OK. OK, so I, I got that. All right. Anybody else want to weigh in on that question? What are things you would like to see that uh, would help your company be more successful in pursuing work with Wisdom? Hi, my name is Signe Reichel. I'm with Banking Materials Engineering. Okay. And I, I second that, not on the design, but just um, under consultants. So that consultant side, if there could be a larger DBE. Um, I'm a niche kind of unit. We are testing, but I feel like if that DBE um, percentage went up that, you know, they'd be like, oh, well, I'll, maybe I'll sub out testing. So, you know, that's my one thought. So if the DBE percentage went up, um, I'm not following uh, that response because uh, it was a little different than the previous response. So, yeah, sorry, I was kind of just piggybacking on that, but it's more on um, I do see a large DBE on the contractor side. And okay. I can't work on the contractor side as a consultant because I'm testing and I can only test for the agency because that's where I get all of my work and I can't test QC when I'm doing acceptance testing. So I need to fall underneath the consultant side. And um, I'm just not, uh, you know, on the August solicitations or even the bi-monthly solicitations, there's not that DBE there that they would, you know, use us or you're looking for goals is what I'm hearing. Yes, if there were more yes. goals on consultant projects. And this okay. is Thank I you. would Sorry. suspect um, to 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 Sydney's point, I, I would suspect that that would be an unbundling as a best management practice with uh, on the consultant services side um, that that's quite used often for the contractor or the contracting effort. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what that term means. I'm sorry, I'm super new to all of this, so um, I appreciate you know so, any so, thoughts on it. So just a, a clarification, unbundling would mean uh, having um, a breakout, you know, of a smaller um, contract uh, from larger contracts. So, um, but I won't get totally sidetracked. But I want to give you that explanation. Okay. Well, others, that. others want to co uh, comment on that. What are things that you would like to see that would help your company be more successful in pursuing work with WISDOT? Identify yourself as a consultant or a contractor. Ugo with uh, NAMEC, Wisconsin. Uh, identify yourself as a contractor on behalf of the contractors. I think the two of the things that jump out to me are going to be looking at just the intention that for, for WISDOT. How can WISDOT be of more value uh, to our membership, to our constituency on the, on the contractor side? And I think the two things that really jump out to me is just, you know, pro, how do you be more proactive? How do you be more intentional? You know, even looking at earlier when they talked about, you know, a DBE firm being listed, but the concern, obviously the concern of the perception being not utilized, um, you know, and even looking at that instance, how can WSDOT be more proactive in the verification to make sure that DBE firm is being utilized? But going uh, back to your, um, back more specifically to your question, that same concept um, when we're looking at um, uh, being intentional, being proactive, unbundling, I think, again, is a great tool. So when you're looking at, you know, when you see DB contractors, uh, especially when you're looking at, um, you know, some of the, the demographics that have not been 
being utilized or have the same type of success as some of the other demographics. How can you be pro proactive? And again, I've seen it work on the corporations side, corporate corporations when they do supplier diversity. Uh, when you're able to vet and establish diverse firms that have a demonstrated capacity in a certain area, how can you be? Um, how can you utilize unbundling as a tool, right, to help? Uh, whether it's networking, whether it's engagement, um, you know, but how do you, if you if you know that a diverse firm in contracting, I'm speaking to a contracting, but obviously this could also be used towards consulting and the young lady that mentioned um, quality control testing. Again, if you have a firm that has a demonstrated capacity in that area, you have a project that you know there's going to be a significant amount of work in this area. You have diverse firms that have demonstrated capacity within that particular niche market or, or um, um, subset of a market, um, then how can you be intentional to use unbundling as one of the many tools that you can increase their participation opportunities, especially especially when you're looking at, again, demographics that um, that there's huge disparities in their participation. All right, wonderful. Anyone, any, anyone else want to weigh in uh, to that um, question or do we want me to go on to another question? I want to hold it out there. What are things, uh, right, Madalena? I see Karen has her hand up. Okay, Karen, jump in there. So I just want to say that the DOT and the DBE office have been extremely helpful in our growth. And every time I do reach out with a question or concern, I am able to get some kind of resource or answer. I think it's more on the expectation of the contractor. So the DBE and DOT have everything in place, but then it kind of just falls from the contractor to the subcontractors. I'm sorry, uh, Karen, can you, can you repeat that? I had a hard time hearing you, I'm sorry. Karen, do you have a phone on also? Maybe if you're on phone and computer, that might be why we're not hearing you. So if you're on the phone, mute your computer, but talk to the phone. Okay, Karen. Um, okay, so what I heard Karen saying was basically she reaches out, the um, DB office is supportive, is responsive. She's having an issue primarily um, with industry not communicating with her. K Karen, if I mischaracterized that, then <laughs> type something in the chat, please. Um, but that was what I was getting from um, what okay. you said. Karen's firm is a Hispanic woman-owned trucking firm. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I Craig, just, were you trying to say something? Yeah, I was just about ready to. So this is Craig Summers, Pro Electric Contract Tractor. Um, I just want to say, I think DBE office has really done it. Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Karen. You there? Okay. Okay. For some reason, I got kicked out, but it's still going on. Okay, so my my concern is more on the contractor side. Okay. So I feel like the DBE resources were given and the DOT helping out as well, that all works out wonderful. I, I believe the miscommunication always happens from you know, the contractor level down to where, you know, the example where they, they're utilizing your name and your commitment, but they're not letting you know hey, we're going to use you for this. And I believe Ugo may have mentioned that kind of gives the DBE firms a bad name if it hasn't happened to us yet. But if we overcommit not knowing that somebody has utilized us, there's no communication on that, you know, it leaves us leading the business blind. Okay, thank you for that feedback. All right, um, so who who's trying to get in there? Craig, come on, Craig. Yeah, so, uh, um, but I just want to want to say I think the office has done has done a great job with, with uh, everything everything they've done, especially for the past couple of years. <clears throat> One of the things I think that would help build capacity is reach, reaching out to the smaller people. Your, your question was, how does it help me, a contractor? Um, I guess I figured out the system. I know how it works, and, and I, I again I think you've done a wonderful wonderful job. But reaching out to the little guys, the small the small contractors, the smaller companies, the ones that think. 
oh, this isn't for me. No one cares about me. I mean, we all know that's not, that's not true. So how we can reach out to that. that. Um, as, as far as Karen, um, the, the, her struggle struggles with contractor to subcontractor. One of the stances we take, we take the company, which makes some people upset, but um, when, when you use the um, attachment in A form, I will not find it unless, unless it's signed and sent to me, to me first. So, so we send out a blank blank check actually. We we wait, we have the contractor sign it, send it to us. So when I have a signed co copy of that, I sign it, I send it back. I know that they're committed to using me on that project and there's no more questions about it. Um, if you're sending out blank, blank form, now you're getting and you have, have no idea. It takes a lot of a lot of follow. A lot of times rings right after putting contract contractors get quiet. So I would suggest doing that. It's worked for us. Thank you, uh, Brittany. Our biggest issue with not signing the attachment A is the contractor will sit and say they need one before the 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 bid goes out, and they don't appreciate when we don't sign them. Like we have to sign them, and then we just had an instance with a very large project that we didn't know until nine months later that the project even got awarded or that we were used and now we have price changes and it's becoming a huge huge issue with this project and now we gave up the project okay so so, so that seems to be a consistent theme you're, i'm going to ask if you're not talking to turn off your um turn off your speaker or um your mic uh so so that seems to be a huge issue or not a huge issue but an issue that's been flagged during this conversation that communication between the contractor um is is something that we uh, the uh WISDOT needs to kind of check into so we got that register other other um things that you would like to um discuss uh regarding um uh what things would you like to see uh to that would help your company uh, be more successful with pursuing work with WISDOT anybody else before I move on uh, yeah, Bruce, Bruce has his uh, hand up yeah. Bruce go right ahead yeah uh Bruce Span uh consultant comments uh I think what was again from the other consultants I think what was what was uh, talked about was really that uh, like the current NOIs, there are no DBE goals for consultant uh, opportunities, and that's been um, you know the case for a, a while now. But I, I know the DOT is aware of that. The the thing I think can help us more with, especially with the additional work that that's coming up through the current through the authorizations that will hopefully be um, signed off on and and flowing through over the next several years. Uh, one of the things that has been talked about by the DOT is small purchase contracts for small businesses. Uh, these smaller projects and other opportunities that are coming up, I think that would be very helpful to us to be able to, to be um, awarded work under a small purchase contract. Uh, our firm uh, has benefited from that, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. We just signed a renewal on a small purchase contract that uh, we have uh, ongoing now with the DOT and the other item I know has been talked about, but I I guess I still struggle with how it's going to be implemented for the professional services side is the mentor protege program where again with the uh, quality based selection, how do you give the opportunities for the, the mentor protege to be able to do work if they agree to join? So that's another way around i know other states uh have the uh, either the political will or or the resources or the capabilities but like for example florida dot i know for for projects under that are under a half a million dollars only dbe firms can pursue uh, pro professional service contracts that are at a half a million dollars or less uh, I know that's a lot for us, relatively speaking, for for Wisconsin. But if there's a way that we could uh, find a way to to have men a protege firms or teams be able to to have an opportunity to do work together, that would be great. But small purchase contracts, I hope, is really going to stay on the radar for DOT, and I believe it will. So your 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 um, comment had two dimensions. It had the one it uh, one dimension of a a small contract for DBEs, but then it also had the issue if you participate in mentor protege, maybe there's a project 
you know, a demonstration project or a project at the end of that um, partnership? Yes. That, okay. Yes, but that's the challenge is with QPS how to how to do that. Okay. All right. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the next question unless there's someone else that want to weigh in on this question that we've been um, bantering around. Madalena, you look like you might want to weigh in. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to note that Jeff Johnson had put a comment in um, the chat about looking at sole source or set aside contracting. We do get questions about this a lot, and I haven't addressed anything else, but I want to address this one quick just to say that we can't do. Um, set aside for DBEs that is prohibited in the regulation, but we are looking at other ways, like Bruce mentioned, um, of small purchase contracts. We can also do a small business initiative type of um, contracting where it could be open to all businesses of a certain size. Uh, so we're looking into those options, but we um, we can't do an actual set aside. This is a DBE contract, so just to um, address that quick. Okay, thank you all for your comments. Yeah, so you can do a race neutral piece where it's where where it's a small business, but it's not set aside for a specific race. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. All right. I think. Okay. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, Ruben. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, this is Dr. Singh. Okay. Uh, well, one approach is a master contract under the master contract program. The smaller firms who have specialties. Are a, are a full service firm, they can definitely provide those opportunities and that's how the majority of the work is being done. Okay. Like we see the notice of interest and there is hardly any project that smaller firms can go after. But if we use the mechanism of master contracts, as Bruce pointed out, uh, some of the projects can be awarded to firms like us and we all can get benefited. But right now uh, we are just getting totally eliminated from design. All right, noted. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to advance us to um, the next question. And so if we don't get through like uh, all of the questions and conversation today, this is going to be a continual conversation. So uh, we like to make sure that uh, next month that you come back to keep this conversation going because it's going to take a while to really kind of come up with some strategies that that might work but the wish dot is committed to uh, continuing these conversations so uh, so thank you for uh, for the comments uh, the next question um, what are some of the biggest barriers that your company face in trying to do work with wish dot are there barriers that you're facing you know uh, what are some of the biggest barriers that you might face and uh, and I want you to continue to identify yourself as consultant or contractor. Everything could be well. Maybe you don't face any barriers, and that's fine. But if there are barriers that you face, what are some of those? All right. So I'm going to assume that you know that uh, your silence means that this is a perfect world, and that uh, you are not experiencing any barriers as companies. Or maybe you're scared to say something on this uh, call. But well, I wouldn't well, say. Well, well, it. I, I think what I said earlier to me that's also the same as as a barrier for me. Uh, I can't think of other barriers right now. Okay, there was a com com comment in the chat. Um, that I can't see. Let's see here. Okay. Well, hopefully your eyesight's better than mine. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's from Anne at Aerocrete. Uh, so she's a contractor and she's saying the main barrier we face uh, are the strict quality control issues we come up against. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's good to know. It's, you know, something our office won't be able to do anything about. Sorry, but, um, you know, the way I've sort of been approaching this in trying to think about, you know, solutions and addressing barriers at the same time is, um, and Jeff and I, I see you nodding because uh, we just had this conversation the other day is sometimes we approach what could we do from the perspective of, you know, like we know these are the rules, these are the regulations, this is what statutes say, so we have to stay in this box. But I really invite all of us to think about this as if, okay, none of those things exist. What would we do if we weren't thinking rules, rules, rules all the time? Because I think there's some piece then 
of those ideas that we would come up with that we could implement. You know, once we put the rules back in and we factor in our boundaries, there is still some usable piece. And so while we have to be based in reality eventually, I don't want that to be something that just keeps us in a cage so that we aren't able to have the bigger thoughts. Thank you, Matt. Great, great, great point. I think I'm a uh, good opportunity to piggyback off of that. Uh, just Again, just looking from a, um, a small business owner perspective of uh, things that have that we know have worked that I know have worked. Um, um, so when you talk about roadblocks or barriers, like one of the things that jump out from our constituency, and, and I know it, it sounds very, um, uh, it's very general, but sincerity, or in better terms, lack of sincerity. Um, uh, and again, that's perception. You know, so if, if if you don't think that you have a sincere opportunity to participate with a prime or on a project, obviously, obviously, it's going to result in not pursuing it and not being con and definitely not consistently pursuing it because as a small business owner, you only have a certain amount of time in, in every day. So, uh, so again, looking at a small business owner, what's the solution? But more, more importantly, more particularly, how can WIST DBE office be a solution? Uh, and one of the things that 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 I've seen, for, again, from in the supplier diversity space, in in the utility industry space, um, successful ones have been. You're looking at both sides of the table, right? So you have primes. You may have primes that say, "Hey, we can't find anybody." And then you're also on the same point where you have diverse firms saying, I can't find any work. So so again, looking at Wista, you know, how can you be that one to facilitate that conversation to say, hey, your A and B C prime contractor, we know that you do A, B, C, D, E type of work. Uh, we have a few firms that we have demonstrated that we know have demonstrated capacity. How about you take a look at those firms? And, and again, it's not it's not a shotgun marriage by any means, uh, but but what I found from successful diversity firms again, this is corporates, corporations, uh, so it's, it's, it's a little obviously a lot different. Uh, but what I found there is that even when they're able to facilitate those conversations with that DB office facilitating those conversations, recommendations, um, and then meaningfully. If you're doing two or four or eight or ten of these on a month or quarterly basis, and then you know you meaningfully follow up within a quarter or three or six months later, that inf and you follow up with that prime to say why or why didn't you do business? Either way, you've got information because if they did do business, great, and you can say why that was successful. But even if they didn't do business, you can walk away and say, hey, this is some information that we took back to say why they didn't do business. Uh, but so so I mentioned all that to say again is that's going to be able to me help, you know, mitigate or reduce some of that uh, perception of lack of sincerity, whether it's primes or the, or the opportunities and so forth. So so you're saying feedback uh, from the contract is to say if you weren't selected um, for whatever reason, why weren't you selected? Maybe that type of feedback. Yeah, and, and it starts out with, with, with again, as Madeline mentioned, and I like how, the way you mentioned it, you know, um, thinking outside the box. I never think outside the box. I never put myself in the box. So if, if we're all just free thinking to say, you know what, hey, if rules didn't apply, what are some things that WISDOC could do? And again, I'm just looking at some things that I've seen, you know, uh, diverse firms. And again, how do you how do you manage that? Obviously, I know the, the rules, the regulations. We obviously want to make sure it's legal. Uh, you know, and uh, that's first and foremost, uh, you know, so how you, how you manage doing that is, is again, that's a totally different conversation. Uh, but but again, this is something that I that I've seen work. And, and back to your point, Ruben, the, 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 the big part about it again is the WIS.DB office taking the lead, you know, uh, you know, not taking the lead, um, but um, helping to uh, help facilitate those introductions or those recommendations. Or those conversations, um, you know, and that's that's one thing that I that I that I see is is something that I've seen work in in other avenues, and I was wondering if that's something that could be applicable here. Okay, all right. So I'm going to put a question um, specifically to uh, contractors um, again because early in the meeting uh, it was brought out that you know um, 
the contract experience would be, will be different than the consultant experience. How can projects be structured to help your company be a more successful bidder? So what do we need to do to help you be a more successful bidder? What does WISDOT need to do? Contractors respond, please. This is Craig. Um, I think one of the one of the things that gets miss, missed is the DE office isn't above hand. It's not about, about giving somebody work. It's about building and fostering relationships. And I think the most beneficial thing that's happened to me is the able to work with other primes and get their name out, name out, and who they are. Okay, so you're saying okay. that so right. it's a relationship. It's a relationship. It's a relationship thing. I think that I think that helps them. Anyone else? Uh, Craig, uh, okay. Anyone else? Okay. As as a DBE, as a as a DBE uh, contractor or subcontractor, what needs to happen so that you're more successful as a bidder with with that? I think just gonna just name out there and get involved. Reach out to prime and contractors. Let them know who you are, instead of waiting for them to them to reach out to you. Prior to bid, I get all kinds of emails and everything. Who the the project manager will be from the prime prime contractor? That's your that's your prime opportunity to reach out out to them and say, here's who I am. Here's what I'm gonna do. Here's how I'm looking at the job. And you start doing that and calling, they will call you for other projects. Okay. All right. Um, so the next question I'm going to direct specifically to um, consultants, and we talked about it some. How can WISDOT solicitation process be improved to help companies like yours? And we talked about structure, you know, and things like that. But what what needs to happen with the solicitation process, or if any, to help um, small DBEs or um, DBEs that are not included as much as they'd like? What does that need to look like? Consultants. I think on the federally funded projects, uh, if we if we put 10% participation for the consulting firms, the primes to include the DBEs to provide design services, that will balance it or in, improve the participation of a uh, DB firms, DB consulting firms. But maybe how, how different is that than what they currently do? Because I mean, the department does that now. Um, Ruben, what is happening at this point is a lot of projects are design projects are awarded more or less as a master contract. And in that there is no requirement for participation for DBE firms. So there are two ways. One is the DBE firms are awarded the project directly are the second one is the majority of the projects that are going to the non db is a participation requirement let's say 10 percent whatever the goal is so that way we can firms like us can participate in the design and uh, we are not alone i think majority of the db firms uh, with the exception of few they're not participating in design so that will be one way we can help. Okay. Yeah. So I do want to address that one quick, just because, um, because it seems to be the quick answer on the consultant side. Let's just add more goals. Uh, but what we know from how consultants are currently being used and our DBE consultants um, as well is that the department chooses the same firms that they've been working with over and over again. So if we put more goals on projects, it stands to follow that the same firms that are getting the work will now just get more of the work. So what we're trying to come up with in solutions is how can we diversify, spread out those contracts amongst more firms? So it isn't always the same 20 firms we're seeing. And you know this is understandable that the department makes choices to work with people we know, right, Brian Mitchell? That's what we do. We work with people we know. But 
we have a responsibility to say, okay, well, how can we get to know more people then? Because we cannot just continue um, to keep all of the resources amongst a few. Um, and it's not sustainable as a practice for WISDOT either. You know, we need to make sure that we're building that reliable pool too. And we can take into account risk management of projects. Yes, we can't just go with all un unknown commodities. Um, but we know there are firms out there um, that we can work with that maybe we've worked with in the past and haven't now for one reason or another. But what can the DBE department do to start facilitating more um, of those selections to go to more firms? So that's really where we're trying to think outside of the box as well. Goals can do it in a minimal way, but that won't be our only answer. Okay, Joe Davis. So Madeline, I have a, a possible solution for you. Um, you okay. know, during the, during the letting, um, you know, they do supply prime contractors price quotes, right? And if you find that a contractor is submitting price quotes but not being utilized, uh, maybe, you know, you might want to go to that prime con, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the DBE. If the DBE is submitting uh, quotes to the prime contractors but not being utilized, then maybe we need to take a look at the DBE, have a conversation with the DBE, and then also have a, uh, a conversation with prime contractors to say, hey, we've got this DBE that's been submitting price quotes. We have the price quotes that's been submitted to companies. How do we find a way to utilize them? And I'll share with you why. So you Joel, know. hang on one second though, because I just want to, for clarification, say you're making great points but that's on the construction side. So we definitely can do that kind of follow-up on the consultant side, which is what we were just talking about previously with those goals and how we're diversifying contracts. Those are all qualification-based solution and so, or um, selection. So we don't have, we've got, it's a, just a completely different way that we relate to those selections. But if you wanna talk about construction, I do wanna hear, your um, your suggestion there about working with DBs and primes. So the, the question that I have is that, are there some consultants that are not being utilized, but are submitting price quotes? And if they are, I mean, you can use the same analogy or the same methodology. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, they're not quotes, but you know, when we look at responses to solicitations, there are certainly DBs who are not responding at all anymore. And we have been, I'm trying to work with them as well to find out why aren't you, um, do you want to work with WISDOT? What are the barriers to working with us? Why are you perhaps not putting in um, any responses? So yeah, we do that on both uh, both sides. So, yeah. um, so to summar that's... yep, yep. So to just summarize my comments is that if, if, if DBEs are submitting pricing to prime contractors and not being utilized, then maybe we can go back and find out why they're not being utilized. Because, I, I, you know, we had a contractor last year that didn't do any work. Um, we sat down with them and, and, you know, through certain folks, we talked to prime contractors and now he's being utilized. And sometimes I think it's, it may be just ships passing in the night, but, you know, just a little bit right. more effort to try to get them in a loop of conversations with prime contractors for utilization. Thanks. For nice. sure. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. So the the on the consultant side, sometimes uh, a lot of times it's all about getting on the team, right? You know, and um, you know, I, I, do you have? I guess the question to um, the DBE consultants: Are you finding that you you're having trouble getting on the team? Because getting on the the right team, the winning team, sometimes it is a, it can be a problem, and sometimes that has to do with relationships, or sometimes it just has to do with uh, you're just not going to be on, on on my team. And we know um, the firms that win most of the time. Is that an issue? I that is exactly that's uh, if you take a look at the projects that are awarded, you can very easily see a pattern. The very select number of firms. Are on are on on all the teams, so there could be a concern that that uh, small DB firms are not reaching those larger firms. But our experience has been that even if we reach, it's a dead end. I mean, there is there is no opportunity. So the question is, what can we do as a part of the DB program? to distribute the work among uh, among larger number of of db firms 
Okay. Is anyone else having that experience as a consultant where you can't get on the team or do you see that as a problem? Well, you know, the uh, you know, the the larger projects, of course, the the larger firms have the people that uh, are able to look at forecasts and or uh, they can meet with with the clients to find out what's what's coming down the pike and and for you know for us especially on the on the mega project type of work or opportunities if you don't get in during the study phase then you're probably not going to get on the team mm -hmm. um, like for example we were on the east west uh not before and then before it was um suspended or canceled i forget which phrase uh, uh governor walker used but uh, the, now that's back up again and i'm hopeful that we're going to still be on that that project. We were part of the we were scheduled to be on the preliminary engineering and we had negotiated a contract with then CH2M Hill, um, but it hadn't been executed, of course, until they had a contract with the with the DOT. So so I'm I'm hopeful that Jacobs is still going to have us be part of of that project. Um, and I guess I'll just segue into that. That was also part of my thought process when I did not uh, request to participate in today's Engineering Opportunity Day interviews and presentations because I was counting on being on that project. Maybe I should not have uh, counted those eggs because they haven't hatched, but I took that that uh, route. But but for those bigger projects, if if you're not in with the, the AECOMs or or Jacobs, uh, early on, Michael's it's it's really difficult to to get on those projects later on, and I so, think that's true even for 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 mid-sized firms too, like you know firms like a Gray for Kapoor. If they're not the prime, I think if they don't get in on right at the start, it's it's more of a challenge. But it's really more of a challenge for us. So that's just the nature of the business. It's not wist up, but right. it's just the nature right. of how primes and and uh, sub sub. Uh, consultants uh, kind of work together, right? right? So I see Brian Mitchell has a hand up. Is that you, Brian, trying to get in? It is. Um, listening to Bruce talk about being part of teams and listening to Madalena talk about it, I'm curious as to how this works with design build as Wisconsin DOT flirts with that method of project delivery. Yeah, I'm really curious too. Um, I've been part of some of those discussions and I don't quite know how the mechanics of the uh, of the project works as well. Uh, I think that it's sort of a hybrid in terms of how it will be presented. But Matt, I see you there. Do you understand it better <laughs> before I say something wrong? OK, go for it. How are you? Hey, Brian. Um, Really good question because there, there's been a lot of um, questions related to this. Ironically, I just heard a speaker uh, that we had regarding design build, and this was one of the topics. And they've pushed, they've done design build for 20 years. Um, throughout that process, they've continued to tweak all phases of it. So they're still at times struggling with selection, with RFQ, RFP, all, all of that. One thing that he did bring up was that DB needs to be handled differently on design build if you want to maximize participation. He said, mm -hmm. don't don't make people lock in at the time of RFP because exactly you don't know what exactly what the work is at time at that time. So you can have a goal, but as the as the process um, progresses, that's the point at which contractors will have an opportunity to add more DB participation as you go in. If, if you try to lock in early, it won't make sense because you don't know exactly what you're locking into at that point. Right. You'll be locking into a great deal of risk. Yeah, you just don't know. You, you just don't know what, what what exactly you're doing yet at that point. Right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I so go ahead, um, Pratel. Um, Dr. Singh, go ahead. Yeah. I think what Matt said is it's one approach. But if that approach 
for uncertainty and the uh, for Dr. Singh, you keep freezing up and we've only got a short minute here. So maybe we want to wrap it up and you can, will you follow up with us after? Or maybe turn turn off your camera, uh, turn off the video and then maybe quick make the statement that sometimes works. Okay. Now try. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me now? Much better. I think the what Max said is definitely that's one one point of view, but we for the consulting community, I can talk more. What I see is if early on, if there is no commitment, and then that is left only on the, the design build firms to make a decision at a later date, it will bring more more DB community going to land in. Okay. All right, so thank you for that, Dr. Singh. I can tell you I've worked on a design build project in uh, Washington, D.C., and the design build project gave um, the uh, firms an opportunity to put a DBE utilization plan together in advance uh, to talk about, you know, what their approach would be to use um, DBE. So there's a lot of um, leeway that you have with that design build, um, it, particularly uh, since the uh, mm. designer will be a, a part of the team. So. Um, you should have a plan for um, the um, uh, how you're going to get your DBE um, achievement through design and construction early on with design build projects. That's just from my um, uh, mm -hmm. first hand experience. And I can speak at least to that amount of it and say that we do have goals on these design build projects. And so there are two now, um, two projects instead of three, but um, those two started with a range and now do have set goals. OK, so we'll see you all at the main meeting. Thank you. Thank you. He's going to be able to join us because he is, um, I believe, on a plane um, traveling back to Wisconsin from Louisiana from um, some sort of national apprenticeship meeting down there. So I will, unless, yeah, I can fill in um, and uh, facilitate our, our committee discussion today. So I have some notes from Josh. Um, that he was going to use um, in facilitating. So thank you all for joining us. And hang on just a second. I just want to make sure that we have everybody that we need with us here. All right. I think Tracy's going to be, Griffith from Wabak Group will be coming back. She had to step away for a little while, but plans to come back and join us. So I know at our last meeting, we spent a lot of time talking about identifying our priority areas to work on for this year as it relates to um, workforce. And some of the things that I recall that we talk about, we did talk about, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, was like some of the biggest issues or areas of concern that we talked about was workforce hiring, so finding and recruiting good talent, uh, the culture of attracting younger workers to the profession, the challenges related to that. We also talked about pre-apprenticeship programs, so what types of programs are out there, uh, following uh, these apprentices once they are in the program to help support them and keep them in the program. So that came up as part of our discussion, talked about daycare challenges for those um, who are who have difficulty, who are interested in um, our line of work, but um, may need to be traveling um, to various jobs and how do we tackle that and maybe look at some ways that industry could come together and help address that to deal with some of the workforce shortages that we're dealing with in the industry. Um, and then looking at the DBE uh, supportive services. So as it relates to particularly workers um, who are um, on construction jobs and who've moved through apprenticeship uh, programs and who've been um, who are working um, in the industry and might be interested in becoming DBE firms. So how do we can kind of career that create that career pathway? I hope that I'm not losing you all because I just got a message that there is bad connectivity on my end. So hopefully you can hear me. OK, good. <laughs> so anyway, oh, and then the other thing too that we did want to touch on as well is that we have been talking with our trans providers about how we might capitalize on 
um, as we're, you know, Wistat has uh, the trans program and how we might capitalize on um, bringing forth uh, folks that are we're training in the trans program and um, introducing them to contractors. So I think we also have another DBE that's with us. Jacob Perez, are you a DBE firm? Jacob, Hello. can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, are you a DBE firm? No, no, I'm not. I'm uh, I'm with the uh, Small Business Transportation Resource Center. We oh, okay. uh, assist with DBEs and small business. Yeah, I think we need to get you into the DBE business um, breakout session. So yeah. this is the yes. labor. So Christina, if you can move Jacob over to that session, that'd be great. Um, mm -hmm. I, I still yeah. need to be moved also. Who is this? Brittany. Yeah, yeah. Brittany. Can you mm -hmm. hear John Anderson? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, because my screen is totally blank and I can't see well, anybody. We can see, we can see you and we can hear you. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Great. So if you so don't make faces as I'm I, talking. I'll try not to. All my controls because, are gone. I'll just because I will chill. call you out. So. Yeah, I'll just be real chill. <laughs> Jacob and I have spent, been spending way too much time together the last <laughs> couple of days. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, John. Jacob, we're going to get you moved over to uh, to the other session as well as Brittany. So thank you. It should both be being moved over. That's okay, all right. So I gave you that overview. So who would like to jump in and just like talk about like what we should focus in on and maybe come up with some strategies? John, you or you want to go ahead and start? I, well, well, I had I had a question and I was going to save it until the breakout. I didn't want to do it in the big group. But I was curious if uh, under that, with the labor utilization report, would it be mm -hmm. possible to include information on who is a trans grad on that list? Is that asking too much? Is that something that could be done? Um, yeah, I think we can do that. Just Basically, curious. I'm just really yeah, curious. It little, yeah, it would take us a little bit more time to do that. But yeah, I think we can do that. OK. Yeah, so I'll make a note of that. That was my uh, and Michael, comment. you're Michael, you're on the you're in this group. Is that something that Margaret could help us with? Oh, I can check with her. I don't know. I don't okay. know what the report would be able to provide, but we can attempt to do it. Sure. Yeah. So the report that that I'm sharing with this group every month, Michael, is Margaret's report that she provides us. OK, I'll follow up with her. OK, great. I think you, I think that um, what you are asking of us makes a lot of sense because it would be nice mm. to see like, you know, where these trans grads, you know, are they actually um, involved in any of these projects that we're highlighting? For sure. So anyway, but does anybody have any ideas or want to talk some more about priorities or even, even since the last time we met, is there anything else that you've been thinking of? All right, well, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to kind of go around. Andrea, what do you, what do you, what's, what do you think? Um, again, just reflecting on our talks from last time and even the, the point that John just made, you know, I think it's, it's good if we can see who's moving through the system, who has achieved those things. And I think that will help to further communicate to new people coming into the, um, into the industry and saying, you know, here's here's what happened. Here's here's who made it. Here's how they made it. Um, so I, you know, again, all the groups that I'm involved in, we're all struggling with, um, you know, just gaining new people, gaining new interest. And I think if we can show that trajectory, that is very valuable for people who are um, maybe struggling with that decision. Is it something I can do? Is there the support that I need with childcare or other things? And when you say that, uh, Andrew, are you referring to our trans graduates or just kind of looking at the population uh, as we can track? Yeah, I think um, population in general and the trans grads specifically, because that's such a um, such a good illustration of of how somebody follows through that process. 
Um, and I'm just thinking, for example, so ACI, which is American Concrete Institute, we have a local chapter and uh, NAWIC are partnering up and we're going to have a speaker in March um, during WIC Week, Women in Construction Week, um, talking specifically about how do you communicate between the different generations and how do you um, kind of attract that labor and, and get people thinking in in that aspect because you know people might say this is too daunting I don't want to choose this industry because I don't even know where to begin and if you can start to see just like um, what a few months ago when we had that uh, guest who was a graduate and it, that was such an energizing meeting and he had such a great message like how can we do more of that to to attract that and to fortify somebody's choice that yes I'm I'm making a good choice and there will be support for me and there is success there is a light at the end of the tunnel <laughs> so, yeah yeah so I'm going to ask David Polk um and Jessica Gitter who's with us about you know how we might be able to track um folks in the system and looking at highway high, heavy highway construction how we might be able to do that to see you know like what type of impact we're having and what more you know what more work do we need to do to, um, you know, to do the outreach um, to uh, to address the labor challenges within our industry? So um, I don't know, David or Jessica, if either one of you have any thoughts on how you might be able to help us with um, that tracking or some data. Yeah, so is this the tracking of individuals from CPAs into the, the highway construction apprenticeships, so to speak? I think it could be, yes. So if we were able to, um, so that information comes from those that report out actually. So those CPA, um, those CPA entities, you know, whether any, any entity basically reporting out to us that those individuals have actually gotten into apprenticeships post participation. Um, we're working on a, a, a structure for more monitoring with regard mm -hmm. to that. And I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to use the term monitoring. I'll, I'll say uh, regulation with regard to how some CPAs report out and their, uh, their reoccurring uh, recognition as a certified CPA. Um, so those are two things that that we're going to work on, and that will then force the um, the CPA, you know, awardees that participate to to give us that information and kind of make it contingent that they forward the information. Um, that's that's kind of the only way that we can actually track those individuals' pathway, so to speak. Uh, Jesse, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I, I, I think you, you pretty much hit it with that monitoring. I think that's going to be really where we're going to see who has gone into a registered apprenticeship from a certified pre apprenticeship and Leo and yours. And so you're specifically, um, focusing on like heavy highway road construction. Is that correct? Yeah. Versus construction in general. Yes, because okay. we want to see how it's impacting our specific. Sure. Purpose. You know right. why? Why we come together on a monthly basis here? So I know what you're saying about the reporting from the CPA. So that would be, of course, with that reporting our information to you all. So, um, and I guess I wasn't sure whether or not if there's you know other than outside of what we do, if there's any other data collection that you are tracking as it relates to who is working you know in the industry. Um, and again, I'm I don't know, so I'm just putting that out there. So that's my ignorance on my part. No, that that's no no problem at all. I think that um, I think that as I think that as the CPAs rolled out and and specifically to the heavy highway industry, um, that the there was a a bit of a gap in the structure, so to speak, and and that's what we we want to uh, address in the coming months. Um, to to add a little more structure to the CPAs, especially with the the, the funding that is attached to them, um, there should be a little bit more astringent reporting out on the participants. 
OK. I, I know that Jennifer, you had your hand raised before Deanna, so Jennifer, do you want to chime in here? Yeah, mine was um, separate from reporting, so I don't know if you want to stay on that topic and if Deanna's. Um, oh, let's just, it's an open discussion. OK, um, I know the last meeting we've talked about like supportive services and those types of things. Um, during the trans provider meeting yesterday, we talked about the importance of like stipends. So I don't know if that could be a discussion for this group. Um, I know we learned a lot from WRTP with what they were doing for some stipends, but maybe having that larger group discussion to see where opportunities might be to um, give students stipends, because I think that would really generate some more um, excitement into our programs. Um, for those pre apprenticeships and opportunities into kind of their path into the road construction, you know, careers. So, um, that, so let's talk that. about that a little bit. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Why don't you kind of expand on what we talked about yesterday at our trans provider meeting and um, yeah. and us BRTP as well. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anyone like from Employment Milwaukee with us. But again, I think sometimes that when you're looking at that is how can the workforce development systems programs help support um, workers, trainees and workers, sort of like what we touched on last time too, that, you know, when, and I, I, cause I think even for myself, you know, we, whenever there is like that support available, it's usually when someone's in the program, but there's not a whole lot of support after people get employed to help them sustain that employment. So I think there's that other gap too, that we don't always spend a lot of time talking about as well. So, but if you maybe can just like, talk a little bit more about what our discussion was about yesterday. Yeah, so um, for our trans programs, it's six weeks and usually our schedules run Monday through Friday, you know, full time hours throughout the week. So we really our students, you know, have a difficult time, you know, coming into trans and not making, you know, the income to pay for rent, utilities, all of the household expenses. So we connect them to the necessary programs so that they can get gas vouchers. So we, you know, we pay for their training, but we don't have funding for kind of covering those life expenses. So um, to provide some sort of stipend so that they can really invest in themselves and get the skill set necessary to, um, you know, get some of those higher wage jobs in construction, um, you know, would be really helpful. So um, just even talking through what funding might be available where, you know, point us in the direction of kind of grants, how do we kind of partner together so that we can, you know, explore those opportunities, but um, something that they have some financial um, assistance while they're attending our trainings. John, I don't know if I missed anything. Yeah, no, that was that was that was great. And thanks for prompting me because my screen is totally blank. I can't see anyone, but um, part of our discussion in this group last time was developing, I guess, what we really kind of coined as wraparound services, but we were wondering from DOT's position if there would be the possibility. And I know we talked and I was looking, I just kind of looked back at the notes and Joshua brought up daycare services. Um, we know transportation, there are other things that can be a barrier. And so I like the word wraparound services, but I think you know that means childcare. That means transportation. Um, it was mentioned that the bureau was giving. Um, I think it was five hundred dollars or was six hundred dollar uh, one-time payments to new apprentices, and that was great. And and I'm not sure where they found that money. Um, as I shared in our our separate meeting yesterday, how in Racine um, the whole uh, stipends is coming about is that the a proposal was given to the mayor of Racine on how they could use some of their American Recovery Act dollars. And so that was approved by the Common Council and that's how they were able to create this carve out to do these stipends. And it's, oh, it's, it's you can call it a pilot because it's only for two years to serve um, 250 individuals over a two year period. But the point is, is they were creative about finding some dollars that were coming down, you know, from American Recovery Act, COVID, all this. So maybe, you know, could this group or, you know, some DOT leadership do something similar in that vein of like um, Jennifer said, are there funds that we could go through as a group or the DOT could apply for 
but could be segregated to help the, the workers, and especially the new apprentices. But I think everybody at some times may have some pitfalls and may need some additional support. But a lot of times it's those first and second year apprentices who need the most support to be successful. So I, you know, and I can respond to funding on the DOT side. So our funding for the trans program comes from our um, federal highways on the job supportive services program, and they have specific criteria. So in that criteria, we're not able to support to provide like funding specifically for stipends. Stipends, they're really pretty restrictive on what we can provide or use our funding towards and they're becoming more stricter. Uh, we had some some big challenges um, with our last um, submittal, uh, particularly with working with our tribal communities um, mm. and having to, yeah, having to actually modify some of our requests. Um, yeah. It was uh, very challenging for us. So I think that, you know, you know, one of the things I would be interested in again, 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 we need to get employ Milwaukee participation in, the, in this group. So I'll reach out to Shaitania is like maybe how do we look at some of our participants and maybe looking at how we might home roll them um, in some of the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act programs to see how some of that support can be provided through home enrollment. Um, I think that on the West side, side, we could probably do a much better job with how we can collaborate, coordinate some of that co-enrollment. Okay. But I, I think this is good to, because we do need to continue to brainstorm. We know that this is a challenge um, for particularly folks who come from low income backgrounds. I wonder if any of the, the contractors uh, or you know associated trade unions would have any appetite to help develop something and when I say develop fund something you know because yeah, it's really no, for their workers it's I mean, it's too bad that Tracy is with us I know that Tracy and I talked last year I know the Wabat group was looking at doing something once in a person uh, once an individual became employed with their company on providing like some funding or some supportive type services and she ran the idea by me I thought it was a fantastic idea um, so maybe the next time um, at our next meeting, we can check in with her to see how that um, yeah. develop, how they're developing that at the wall back group. Because I know this is something that they were very interested in, and they noticed that this was a challenge with some of their um, employees that they were hiring who were having some, ish, um, you know, some financial support challenges, and they wanted to continue to retain them. So I think they were looking at like some scholarship opportunities. So um, I'll make a note to ask Tracy to, to talk about if that's something that they moved forward with implementing at the Wallback group. Um, Deanna, cool. and then we'll go to Alder um, Zamaripa. Deanna. Thank you, Leah. Um, I two, two thoughts. I love the stipend idea, and I know that, you know, a lot of times others who are going on to college training programs you know, there's, there's, they have ability to get grants, loans that helps them get through their program. Um, and so it would be really great if, I, you know, John just brought up, or maybe it was Leah brought up the going to possibly some of the trade unions, but I participated in a stipend like type of program through the federal government that helped me get through one of my training programs. Part of that though, was that I committed to working for a state agency or entity and so um, I wonder if that couldn't be used to kind of maybe get um, uh, you know if we could get some trade unions together or whomever to say yeah let's do this let's give a stipend and then hopefully that's going to build your pipeline of of workers that you need so um, I think that's a great idea why I initially raised my hand was um, just to maybe possibly, I think Leah, you asked about maybe what strategies might we use given some of those identified areas of concern. And one area of strategy I think could potentially center around education. So meaning that I see something on there about about culture. So do we need to do some education with employers um, about the makeup of the workforce and, and how to attract 
um, employees. The other thing would be about how do we educate those people who are in touch with workers or potential workers on the opportunities for different types of um, apprenticeship programs, different type of career pathways. So do we, how do we educate like our, for lack of a better word, like career planners, right? So in, individuals within the workforce system who talk to the people coming to the job centers looking for work, who are at the, the um, high schools, um, things like that, so that we can, um, I guess, try to help fill that need of, of, of labor. Those are really good, good suggestions and good points that you made. Alder Zaparipa. Thanks, Leah. Um, I just wanted to remind folks, um, just going back again to the idea of a stipend. Uh, thank you for, I can't see the gentleman's name, but thanks for letting me know that uh, Mayor Corey Mason and Racine um, did allocate some ARPA dollars for the for this. I would be interested. The city of Milwaukee is getting our second tranche of ARPA dollars um, in something like May or June. Perhaps something that we should continue to talk about. Um, if somebody wants to reach out to my office, um, I, I would be interested in trying to advocate uh, for some dollars to do this. But also, have we gone to Governor Evers, who also, I'm just yesterday I was in committee. And um, we were thanking Governor Evers because he allocated $8 million to the Office of Violence Prevention to further their work as they do a reimagining of public safety. And uh, this is something I could see Governor Evers being interested in. And, and he has a lot of latitude in terms of those ARPA dollars that came into the state. So I wanted to push, mm -hmm. push that out there too. Is it worth it to go to Governor Evers around this idea? Yeah, I think so. And officially, you guys didn't hear about this until Wednesday because the press conference is until Wednesday. But um, I agree. I think maybe going to Governor Evers, and especially if, you know, once um, what's happening in Southeast and Racine is up and running, then, you know, there would be a, a, a case to say this is happening within our state, within our region. It's helping people, you know, and that might even give him more encouragement, you know, and feel comfortable to do that. So. I'd love to be a part of, of that type of an initiative. Yeah, and if I can just add, Leah, could, could you let me know how things go with employee? Because I know Employ Milwaukee oh, did get some ARPA dollars. Is, are any of those monies, I know sometimes they have, you know, the, I can't recall now what their specific, um, you know, direction was with those dollars, but is there some latitude with those dollars that they've already received to do something like this? I'd love to yeah. get connected after you talk to um, Shaitania. I can do that. I'll follow up with Shaitania and ask her, um, you know, to provide us with any um, update or what they're doing with that and how they might be able to assist. Um, I think it's also great um, that there would be some, you know, discussion with the, the mayor's office in uh, the city of uh, Milwaukee to talk about, uh, you know, especially, and I'm going to mention this to you, um, uh, um, Elder Zamariba that, um, you know, and Bob, you can chime in too, you're on too, because we are working on uh, with Federal Highways to do a pilot um, in Milwaukee um, and select some projects we're looking at um, a, through the through the USDLT's most recent federal register that was issued um, that we will be able to um, offer um they allow state DLTs to work with certain populations or put geographic preferences um for uh promoting diverse hiring on on federally funded projects now in wisconsin we have some challenges with that because of a state statute that pro prohibits us from doing that but what we're doing here is we're doing a voluntary pilot project um, and I'm waiting for Federal Highways to approve that. I just sent Mary Florenza an email yesterday because what we did learn was I did submit a work plan to Federal Highways um, detailing how we would work with the city of Milwaukee, specifically with their um, residence preference program. So the residents would need to meet that criteria um, to um, for contractors to hire from um, those individuals who meet that criteria. And um, what we did um, on our end was we made some modifications to um, 
additional uh, uh, special provision, what we call where we provide incentives uh, for reimbursements to contractors who hire trans graduates. Um, and uh, uh, so we give them a reimbursement for that, uh, a dollar amount per hour. And what we did to beef that up a bit is we increased that. And then we also added a new um, area in that provision um, to um, so that people would not get stuck at the entry level, that they would be moved into um, apprenticeship opportunities. So we would do a reimbursement through the um, duration of their apprenticeship. So we would make it much more attractive to contractors. Um, so I'm sharing all of this with you because since we want to, we will be partnering with the city of Milwaukee, it would be great if they could use those ARPA dollars to think about and think outside the box on how we they could be able to support folks um, coming from those communities who are low income, who are going to need some of this show support to sustain their employment. So anything that you could do to help us with some yes. of those discussions would be very helpful. And Bob, I don't know if you want to chime in and add anything else. You're on mute. Well, for some reason we can't hear you. Well, can I just say, Leah, before we move on, I know we're running out of time, but I just wanted to say, I think this is definitely worth a further conversation offline so that we can start to get ready for this, because of course I want to be helpful. Yeah, yeah. And maybe, um, I don't know, Bob, maybe we can join, we can connect with um, the elder woman um, to sure. have some discussions and we can talk more in detail about our plan. Yeah. So, because that's going to help increase the pipeline and provide opportunities for individuals who don't know that, you know, we have these opportunities that can create, um, you know, uh, self-sustaining uh, employment with good wages. Yeah. And um, we've really been working hard to try to make this come to light. So, and we want to be able to roll this out fairly soon. We can hear you now, Bob. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I had, I had pressed my mute on my speaker, but... Yeah, we certainly don't want to uh, penalize anybody for I including DBE firms. <laughs> so mm -hmm, the, yeah. the incentive part is is the best way to go about this, and then and then of course keep the competitive bidding environment in in place. So um, yeah. All right. So we'll reach out to you to have some further discussions. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Bob and Leah. Thank you, David Polk. Your hands raised? No. Yeah. Um. I was at a uh, at a hearing or listening session actually yesterday at the state, and they were discussing. Um, it wasn't necessarily stipends, but it it was funds for uh, tools, work boots, um, things of that nature to go to apprentices. Um, in a bill, I think it is attached to some ARPA funding at the state. Um, it's gonna, without disclosing too much, it's gonna be tweaked. Um, I don't think it's gonna pass before this legislative session is complete, which I think mm -hmm. is end of the week. Um, but there was some there was some discussion on that, so there there is definitely some hope in the plan that everyone um everyone has chimed in on in today's meeting um but per, the the one thing that i worry about is as everyone on the call knows that individuals can escalate up a pay scale very quickly when it comes to construction and that's one of the be the beauties of actually getting getting into the skilled trades right um right but we also have to keep in mind that in in most iterations of what would be a stipend or help to for individuals to get in and sustain a career in construction that immediately disqualifies them for a lot of funding strategies right as soon as they hit that income threshold it's pretty much over but in the same at the same time we know the ebbs and flows of construction you know mm -hmm. you have you have a great year and then you have a, an off year um so when we when we put together plans like this i think we since all of us are akin to the 
construction world, we have to keep those parameters in mind to ensure that we're not setting up our um, our future apprentices. Uh, I don't want to use failure as a term, but it, it, it'll definitely be a point of consternation in the future of their career if they're not able to sustain that employment uh, when we've helped them with stipends and, and things of that nature. I hope everyone understands where I'm going with that. No, I do. I think you've made some very important points. Yeah, so it's very important to keep that in mind. Jennifer? Sorry. Um, I think that's a really good um, and important point regarding the stipend and like the benefits kind of dropping as soon as they get into the industry. The one area that we've really looked at is we co enroll as many trans participants as possible in our FSET program. Um, the food share employment and training program because then um, once they gain the employment they might not be eligible for food share but they are still eligible for our program and retention services for 90 days regardless of income so in that period of time we can really help with you know the gas cards the um, boots you know work clothing those types of things so um, the the key thing there is getting them, them connected to the right programs before they enter the industry so that we can kind of address those benefit cliffs that tend to happen for people that enter those high wage jobs. And it allows for that smoother transition, right? Right. If it's, mm -hmm. done, if it's done correctly, right? Yep. Yeah. John? And just for anybody who wasn't aware of how, you know, the FSET program works, it's a a 50 50 program which it's a 50 percent uh they put in and then requires a 50 percent match so for someone who might you know be somewhat of a detractor wondering well if someone is being cold enrolled and receiving other services why would they then need a stipend well that stipend will help with costs that fall outside of programming plus the Typically, those trans, I, I'll speak for us as a trans parole provider, um, we have to come up with that match, which then means we can't liberate funds to help them with other issues. And FSET is awesome, um, but there's sometimes are things that will fall outside the purview. It's great to support them with uh, tools, clothing, boots, gas cards, especially while they're in training, and some supports upon placement, but it starts to taper off. And a lot of people's number one barrier to participation in training is they have to work they have to have an income and so that stipend will help get them over that burden of how can i take time to invest in myself to receive this training to become a dot grad and then you know start my career so i just wanted to for anyone who might be curious like how you know would these work together and would one offset the other um None, none of the sources currently are 100% where there aren't some, some gaps. So, so what I think we're talking about is finding that gap funding that's going to support them until they are stabilized in their career. Correct. Well said. Thank you. Christina, your hands raised. Christina. Sorry, I forgot to hit the mute up. And, and listening to David speak about how somebody can go up the pay scale so quickly, and mm -hmm. also wondering, I mean, that can be hard for somebody who hasn't had that money. Right. Are there programs out there to keep them sustainable? Because I'm seeing, think, just thinking in my head, that's where they can lose the momentum and then they're out of the program because are there programs that help teach them how to save and what the budgeting thing and all of that? And are they the educated yes. that they can the be that type of thing? Yeah, like with financial literacy programs. Yeah. I know that those are typically accessible and available. I know the workforce development system utilizes that, uh, you know, to, to educate. Um, folks who go through the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act programs. Uh -huh. Maybe John and, and others yes. can speak to like how that has impacted or you've been working with that with our population, particularly our trans grads. So I'll just comment and I'm sure that Jennifer is probably going to say the same thing. 
part of the design of our trans world building includes financial literacy, um, which is a component that you have to go through to complete the whole sum of the training. Um, also, individuals who do become co-enrolled in um, FSET or WIOA, both of those entities have a financial literacy component and it's a requirement of getting services, you know, air quotes got up or seeking funds. And so um, I would say for someone whom we're working with, they're probably going to get a, at least a double dose of financial literacy. Um, and it is for that, that, that reason of we know if someone whom, you know, has been, you know, coming out of poverty or has just, you know, been, you know, dealing, struggling with income and now, you know, here they've got this awesome position and income has gone up. How will you manage that? Plus in our industry, there's downturn, there's layoffs. And so it's more about budgeting and managing and, and really understanding that, you know, the necessity to save, do you have a two person income household? You know, it gets very detailed, but I would say, I know it is baked into um, the pre-apprenticeship training. And I would assume Jennifer would probably say the same. And Jennifer, you indicated in the chat that you, uh, this is incorporated into the trans curriculum. Yeah. Would you uh, like to expand on that or talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I agree with everything that John said. We we've, we've always touched on, you know, financial literacy and, and the importance of that, especially with the seasons and um, preparing for, you know, off season saving, you know, whenever possible. So um, we have um, skills instructors that kind of build built a curriculum. We've got some worksheets that go with it. Um, I know in our northeast region, um, we have um, some, you know, guest speakers that come in and talk about financial literacy and just you know, the difference between credit cards, you know, some debts, um, good debt versus bad debt. Um, so all things that we, we spend a lot of time on throughout the six weeks. Thank you, Jennifer. I know we have about five minutes left before we go back into our session. So got a lot of notes here. I think what I'm thinking about is, you know, I think we've come up with a lot of different ways to tackle this and maybe what we should start doing is like actually mapping out um, a plan, uh, you know, ident put those, identify those priorities and then start mapping out what some of the strategies are, putting the steps together. And so I think that what um, Josh and I can do um, prior to next, our next meeting is put together um, like kind of a, a work plan for our group and share that with you. Um, and we can fill that in some more and then start setting some goals and working towards like um, trying to see what we can do to have an impact here. And then I know we also should probably have some follow-up discussions on um, some of the things that we talked about, uh, like <coughs> out to, um, to the elder, woman um, and um, connecting with her uh, and um, and then talking about and doing some more research regarding data collection and what we can track um, as well as what other types of support services that might be available and even um, Deanna did put in the chat too about like how we might do um, you know education and outreach particularly with the workforce development professionals out there um, to help educate them about our industry so as job seekers are going to the job centers or wherever they're interacting with folks who are looking for employment you know how we can um, um, work to educate them about our industry and provide information to them so do you guys are you guys okay with that approach that that Josh and I take some time kind of mapping this out and putting stuff down in writing and she'll putting together like a sketch of a plan um, and then we can fill in uh, the goals and type some time frames to start working on some of these activities. How does that yeah. sound? Because we've Sounds been talking great. a whole lot Sounds for so many great. months. It's time to put a plan together with some action <laughs> steps. <laughs> right. I, I'm ready to start moving on some of this stuff too. And the other thing I know we also talked about too is just kind of there's so many folks out there doing a, a lot of different efforts out there. So I know we wanted to kind of get an inventory of who's doing a lot of the work that we're doing and figure out ways of how we can collaborate um, with some of these other entities who are not a part of our group. So I think that's something that we want to talk about how we might be able to approach that. 
Um, so before we get go back into our breakout sessions, I'm going to ask would one of you like to kind of just give a brief summary of our discussion? Just some high high level highlights to the group to anybody willing to do that. Normally I would make Josh do that as a chair, but. <laughs> Nobody. I'll do it, Leah. Who will do it? Uh, sorry, Deanna, but uh, anyone oh, can jump in you. and help me. <laughs> All right, I can. we'll help thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. It makes me anxious when nobody r volunteers right away. So then I find myself um, doing. That is a great way to make you, <laughs> That's a great way to make you anxious if it's going to have you stuff up here. I'm all for that. I can pick on Deanna. We are very good <laughs> friends. <laughs> So you guys are a great group. I just I really appreciate the the discussions. I know this is so time consuming coming together every month to meet with us, but we really appreciate your time. Um, this is just so important um, for us to to talk about this and to try to have an impact on 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 what we can do to improve um, labor um, participation and address the. The, the the times that we're in right now. So bringing everyone together from your different backgrounds and areas of ex expertise is very helpful. So really thank you for your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if anybody else has anything to say. We have, looks like we have another minute um, before we go back to their larger group. It looks like Andrew is typing something in the chat here. I guess I was just thinking about the email that I sent you last week, but I don't know if this is oh, the right. Oh yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Right go ahead. Wanna, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, yeah. So a couple of things. Uh, Women in Construction Week, which is uh, March sixth through the thirteenth. And we do have the declaration from the governor for that. So hopefully we can share that with this group and, and maybe yes. get some. Yeah, we're uh, working with our Office of Public Affairs on that. I sent that to our communications person, who, so he's connecting. So yes. Good, that's perfect. Thank you for making that announcement. And don't forget, if you're not signed up for the DBE workshop, please come. It is going. It, it will be fantastic. You will. It, it'll give you again. If you don't have a lot of background, it will give you a lot of great information about what we do. So please register. Thank you, Christina, for orchestrating that. Um, I will turn it over to Leah for the um, full group discussion for the last ten minutes or so. Okay, so I think what we want to do now is we want to go ahead and just have the subcommittees uh, do their report out. So we'll start with the DBE uh, subcommittee, business subcommittee, who is going to be doing the report. Yeah, so um, Madalena and I will do the report. Um, so um, we had a conversation again where we were real specific in trying to get feedback about um, challenges and possible opportunities for uh, DB contractors and challenges and opportunities for DBE uh, consultants. And so um, one of the um, things that seems to um, be prevalent is that how opportunities are structured, whether you're on the contractor side or the consultant side, makes a big difference. Unbundling came up, you know, several times where um, individuals said both on the contractor side and on the construction side, there needs to be smaller opportunities or even that. not necessarily set aside opportunities, but even it could be race neutral opportunities to, to set something aside for uh, uh, for DBEs, uh, small DBEs. Uh, there also um, it was brought up that uh, uh, communication um, between um, contracts, contractors and DBEs uh, seems to um, rise as an issue. Um, we saw that in our earlier conversation with the bigger group where um, someone had a DBE listed and they says, well, we didn't know that we were um, listed. And so making sure that that communication is clear um, is, is one of the things uh, um, that we, we have to do. Uh, several individuals talked about uh, small purchase contracts, you know, might be one of the strategies to help um, DBEs um, do um, more business. Um, mentor protege opportunities. Uh, you know, with a demonstration project, you know, at the end 
uh, would be uh, an, an opportunity. Um, if folks thought that, you know, they could, there was some way that they would be put on a project, then that would be a, a good uh, um, possibility. Um, um, they said one of the things that were brought up as an issue is that they noticed that there's few NOIs that are available uh, to small firms. There need to be more NOIs. And then um, maybe uh, master contracts, you know, that really focus on uh, the smaller firms could be uh, an, an opportunity. Um, and then uh, one individual brought up that there needs to be um, more um, uh, sincerity, you know, uh, and communication about when DBEs are not selected, why they weren't selected. And then there was also a discussion about whether um, uh, uh, the serial selection thing always comes up that the same DB firms get used, you know, all the time uh, uh, by uh, WSDOT. And then there was a conversation about um, um, small companies. I'm trying to look at my sloppy handwriting here. Oh, the one thing is that if you don't get uh, on teams early in the consultant side, um, you, you don't get, you know, on on the teams later. And so a lot of times uh, people say it's not in DOT's hand, it's in the prime consultant's hand uh, in terms of like uh, whether they get brought on a project or not. And then some of the smaller firms just think that they're locked out uh, of those. Last comment that came up, it was a question about with the design build work coming up. How's that going to work uh, uh, for DBE? So um, the department needs to put some thought into that. Madalena, I know I left a lot out um, racing because I know that time is against us, but Madalena, maybe you want to add. Thanks. I think that was a really great summary. Um, and the only thing I'll add is uh, that I, as this conversation continues, we really want to be in that place where we're thinking outside of the box, where we don't start out with the regulations and all the rules sort of um, creating these boundaries for us. But what would we do without rules? And then we can, you know, put that filter of the rules back in afterwards. But um, that's where I'm really encouraging people to think is like, what could we do? Um, let's not limit ourselves uh, because we have great suggestions that come out um, in a majority of those things our office does. And so I, I feel like we have to come to the place where we start thinking of something that's just out there, you know, that we just didn't even think about um, while we continue to do these other things that are so important, like that relationship building and outreach. So thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead and go to the labor subcommittee and Deanna will report out for the group. Yeah, hi everybody. We uh, talked about some of our biggest challenges and areas of concern, which really center around, you know, uh, recruiting workers and and keeping them, um, and how do we get them into uh, some of the programs that we've been talking about, and and so how do we get them there? How do we keep them there? Um, talked about some ideas related to that. So looking a little bit at the data, for example, of trans program graduates, and is there a way to look at how many of them might be in that labor, like could we identify them on that labor utiliza utilization report that Leah shares with us? Um, so looking into that, um, we also talked about, you know, co-enrolling, people in training programs into other workforce development programs related to kind of the supportive services that one might need to keep them in the training program and keep them moving forward on their career paths. And so talked about some stipend ideas that are out there, maybe use of um, the ARPA funds, and those are some of those ideas. Leah and Josh Johnson are going to sit down before the next meeting, kind of come up with some of the ideas we talked about, a plan, put some goals in place, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Deanna. And David, I'll turn it back over to you to close out our meeting. Great, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate everybody uh, participating today. Um, our next meeting will be on March 24th at 10 o'clock. Um, we hope that everybody can make it back, especially the folks who join us for the first time or who haven't been involved um, as frequently. Um, with that, um, have a great rest of your day. Anything else, Leah? No, that's it. Thank you, David. All Thank right. you so much.